Good evening, and welcome to the February 6th, 2017 meeting of the Merrimack School Board. If you could please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Superintendent Chaffrey has been excused uh, from the meeting, uh, may be able to join us later, but had uh, something come up and we hope it all works smoothly for her. So uh, we'll go on to item number two, which is public participation. If you choose to speak, please come to the mic, state your name and address for the record. Seeing none, since I think you're all on the agenda. <laughs> we'll go on to item number three, which is scaling state maps. And I'll invite to the table, Laura Bryant, Bridie Bellamere, Julie DeLuca, Barbara D. Francisco and Deborah Walter. Thank you and welcome. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us here tonight. I'd like to introduce Lara Bryant to my right, who is the Associate Professor of Geography at Keene State College. And to my left, Barbara DeFrancisco and Deb Walter. Uh, Barbara's a fourth grade teacher at Thornton's Ferry, and Deb is a third grade teacher. And of course, you know Julie DeLuca, who's here for support with us as well. Um, I just w would like to inquire if everyone has received the white paper that was distributed. Excellent, thank you so much. Hi, welcome. Um, so I'm not going to go through word by word where everyone has had an opportunity to uh, preview this, but we're pretty excited about the opportunity um, that's come to us as a result initially of Barb and Deb's travels to DC for their own professional growth and development, which is how they came to experience uh, what it's like to interact and um, understand how to develop lessons around spatial um, intelligence connected to geography. Um, so they're going to kind of shape the journey for you. And then Lara is going to speak to the um, kind of conjuncture that we're at at this point, having been invited to participate in this research project. So I'd like to turn it over to Barb and Deb at this time. Hi. So. Four years ago, we started down to Washington to a conference put on by the National Board for Professional Teaching Standards. And it was really awesome to get, I have to say, out of New Hampshire and experience the big wide world of education out there. Um, and as part of the pre-conference last year, we attended a workshop at National Geographic in Washington. And um, one of the activities we experienced was what they call a giant map, and it was of Africa. And it probably, I think, would fill up a gym if we had it. And they're available to rent um, every year. And we just were really excited. We're like, oh, how do we get the money for this? How can we do this? Um, and had a really good time. There were four of us from Thornton's Ferry that were down for that. And really enjoyed it and saw opportunities for our kids and everything. And then um, in September, we had an email from our principal that said, hey, there's this training going on at Keene on Saturday. You want to go? And we're like, well, what's it for? And you're like, oh, it's a giant map in New Hampshire. And we're like, yes. <laughs> um, so we went out to Keene for the day and um, met with teachers from all over the state. And uh, Lara and her crew uh, trained us on the giant New Hampshire map, which I think is like 16 by 24 feet. It's, it's pretty big. And um, because we went to that, we were able to borrow it for our school this year free. It's free, and um, we see a lot of, of use with, with math and map skills and everything, and because we're borrowing it and have the opportunity to do this um, research with Keene, we actually get to keep it longer. So we have it for almost a month and trying to get every child in the school on it for something to get them. So that's where we are. Like, wanna so add? Part of having the map, we wanted to get as many students in the school on it as possible, not just Barb's class and my class. So we've held two trainings so far and invited um, teachers from Master Cole and Reed's Ferry as well as the Thornton's Ferry staff to come and see what the map is like and see if it's something they would like to host. And we're also um, 
having the all the grade levels participate at Thornton's Ferry. So we've opened it up to more grades. And now... <laughs> We also recently had a family dinner at Thornton's Ferry last week where we um, had over 220 families join us and Barb and Deb were at that event and they hosted all the families and students and siblings and did interactive lessons. So this has extended beyond just the school community too into the broader community. And I have to say parents were, were really pleased that this was something that um, involved the kinesthetic component, cross-curricular opportunities, cross-grade level, mentoring opportunities. So for example, Misty Francisco's class um, buddies with one of our preschool classes. And so her students are going to be working with a preschool group and bringing them down so they can participate in developmentally appropriate activities as well. So it's, it's really unfolded um, quite nicely. We're very pleased at all the facets that and people that have been able to be a part of it. So at this point, I would like to turn it over to Laura. I'm sorry, I have to apologize. I'm fighting a cold, so I'm, <laughs> and my medicine, I think, is wearing off. But um, I'm really pleased to be here, and I just have to say that regardless of whether or not they participate in the research, they still get the map because <laughs> they did attend the training. Um, we have been fortunate to be able to um, rent the map throughout the um, New Hampshire Geographic Alliance, um, which I coordinate. We rent it um, for a month each year, and we've been able to give it to different schools and we try to alternate through the state so that different schools have the opportunity and those are the continent maps. Um, this year with um, an anniversary, the 50th anniversary of the Network of Alliances, there's an alliance in each state. Um, National Geographic has gifted a state map to each state so we have our own giant map that we get to keep which is the New Hampshire one that they were referring to. And um, this past year some colleagues and I um, were looking at what would the opportunity be to do research on this to see the most effective and efficient ways to really benefit from using the map in the classroom and use it because it's um, a very limited amount of time even if we have it in the states the schools get it for a week so how can we take that and use it to the best of our advantage and really get the students to have a meaningful experience even though we all know it's fun to play on the map just because it's it, it's a great experience but how can they get the most out of it so um, I partnered with um, the Colorado Geographic Alliance and the Maine Geographic Alliance and the three of us submitted a grant and it's um, through the National Center for Research and Geographic Education and we're a subsidiary um, of, the of the National Science um, Foundation Award that they have and so we have this year grant as a pilot. So this is in its pilot stage. And these are the other people that we've partnered with. Um, specifically um, Beverly Ferrucci has helped us um, develop the math components um, for this, these exercises. And then Kathleen and Susan with Maine and Rebecca and um, Steve Jennings from um, University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. So the um, idea that we have for this um, project is that most of the teachers that are interested in the New Hampshire map are fourth grade teachers because that's where they teach New Hampshire studies. And so we were really looking at, well, what are fourth graders teaching and how can we reinforce the skills that they're already using in their classroom. We've had a lot of teachers that say, this is great, but where does it fit into the curriculum? And, and so we were looking at the math skills that fourth graders are learning in um, math, and then also how does that correlate with geography. And so we were focusing on this idea of how do students understand the concept of scale. So um, measurement in math equates to distance, estimation to interpolation, angles and bearings, and then the Cartesian grid and coordinates. And these are all skills that they're learning. And so how do we group those and order those to actually use scale? I mean, we're using a giant map. What better um, element to teach the students than that concept of scale when they actually can see it right there, walk on it? So. Um, as <laughs> was already said, that we really are focusing on the kinesthetic learning and um, math, math, math manipulatives. Um, and this idea of what does this big map do to students' perception and scale. Um, and then embedded in this is the spatial framework of egocentric versus allocentric um, 
learning within spatial development of when do students start to think allocentrically. So just to tell you what this is, egocentric is that if you were to tell me, am I on your left or your right? You, you know, you have to say, is it stage left, is it stage right, because we're facing different ways, where you could say, am I north or south of you? So if I asked you which direction was north, could you tell me? Oh, we have one, we have one point. <laughs> and, then, and then some people thinking about it. And I'm not going to say Bev had to go look out the window um, a little while ago to tell me that north was this way. <laughs> um, but then um, I, I'm always curious to, the, to look at people when I ask the question, how many of them turn their heads? How many of them change their heads or just turn their bodies to try to figure out where they are in space? And so um, where we learn those skills, whether it's egocentric and transform from egocentric thinking to allocentric thinking, what better way to do that on a map and teach orientation on a map when they can turn instead of on the paper map because they can't turn themselves, they can't put themselves in the paper map. And so what skills are we going to teach? Are we going to teach them where Concord is using a paper map and then teach them the direction it is on the big map when they can actually turn and orient themselves to figure out this direction. So what's the best use of this big map when they have it? And so um, our research is based on learning progressions and really trying to break apart the various stage. So for like the measurement one, we're um, building on work by Barrett and Jin that breaks up the various stages of how students learn to measure items and where would they be in fourth grade. In fourth grade, they are switching from non-standard units to standard units of measurement. And so we try to bit, um, bridge that gap in those lessons. And I'm not going to bore you with all of the research for all of the lessons, but this is an example of the, um, we have really tried to think about what is that learning progression and where are they in fourth grade to take advantage of those skills on the map. And so, for example, one of the things that we have added is grid systems. So if we look at the giant map, and I know that that's not very giant up there, but there's actually two grid systems that are on there. There's one that we call the battleship grid, um, where, you know, like the battleship game, you've got A1, A2, B3. And then we also have latitude and longitude, which are really tiny up there. Um, the problem is, is that in fourth grade, um, there, I made it a little bit bigger so that you could see on this. Um, in fourth grade, the um, longitude is actually on the negative side of the Cartesian grid, and they haven't been introduced to negative numbers yet. So in fourth grade, they've advanced beyond the battleship grid, but they're not ready for the Latin longitude grid that's on the map. So how do we meet the students where they are and bridge that gap to learn about how grids work for finding locations on a map. So um, with Beverly Ferrucci, she um, helped us to um, come up with a lesson where we have twine um, with these wooden holders on the ends and the students actually build their own Cartesian grid for the map starting at zero, zero, so they're working in the positive quadrant, which is exactly what they're supposed to be learning in the classroom at that time. And so then they can walk the grid lines and figure out where one, three is or where five, four is. And so, um, actually build that themselves and create it themselves. So that's one of the examples of where we're trying to bridge where the students are in that learning progression. So um, our main goal with this is just to how can we teach geography across subjects and grade levels exactly where they are and integrate and align these fundamental skills and make it match the fourth grade social studies and math curriculum. And um, one of the um, preliminary preliminary results that we had that we thought was really interesting before we started on this research and it initially did the proposal was asking teachers if they would consider using the map to teach math skills. Um, and it was really interesting because the social studies teachers that we surveyed at the social studies conferences all thought that math was applicable because our whole maps are based on math, um, fundamental math skills. But the math teachers at the math conference did not see the connection of using the map to teach math skills. They said, why would we teach math skills on the map? And so um, that's something that we're really um, trying to get over. <laughs> um, and then also just improve and use this um, great experience to the best of its ability and to maximize the impact that we have. So if they're going to use this map, uh, can they use it in the best way possible? So, and that's taking advantage of the kinesthetic learning. 
So what we've done is um, Bev and Barb have been trained on the National Geographic lessons that were developed, and they're these green lessons that go with every state all across the United States. And so what we've taken is those primary map interpretive skill lessons and really frame them to teach math and to support those math skills while they're on it. And so you'll see the, the grid lesson became the coordinate grid activity. Mm -hmm. um, cardinal directions became getting your bearings where the students are supposed to be learning about angles and so they actually use master angles and figure out the bearings from, um, they pretend they're pilots and what bearing would they go. So they're learning their angles while on the map. Um, what we have taken out, and they can still do this if they wanted to, is the, the location features of where are the physical features on the map and just doing a lesson just on where are these places. Because in order to find those places, all of those places are embedded in the math lessons to find the distance between Mount Monadnock and Mount Washington. Instead of doing a separate lesson, where's Mount Washington and Mount Monadnock, you do the distance and measurement one. They still have to find those locations, but they're doing the math at the same time. And so um, basically, if you um, look at your folder, we have the, um, the cr sample curriculum that we've developed. I've got um, several items in here for you. We've got the um, initial approval for um, Keene State College, and it was considered exempt because of the fact that these, um, the research that's being conducted, one is in its pilot phase, so we're developing, and in fact, the lessons that they're getting, I just rewrote based on our last pilot last week, so these are continued to be developed. Um, and same with the assessment, we wanna make sure it's measuring what we're um, looking for, so this is still in its pilot phase. But it was also considered exempt because it's in the context of normal classroom activities as far as a giant map that you walk on could be considered normal. But, <laughs> but, <laughs> but um, Barb and Deb were already planning on doing this in their classroom. They're already doing, so all we're asking is would you give a pre-assessment before? Would you do the lessons that are focused more on the math instead of geography and then the uh, post-assessment afterwards? So it's not taking anything out of the ordinary, ordinary that they would be doing in their classroom. Um, we, we do have nine schools in three different states that are piloting um, these materials as well as the assessment to see if we can measure any differences. At this point in time, we don't have control groups. We're just seeing how this works so that it really is in a pilot phase of the um, research. So you may see me next year come back when we want to actually have control groups and ask again if we can be involved in this. Um, so there's the uh, um, IRB approval in there. Um, uh, there's also a sheet for the protocol. Um, the other reason why it's exempt is we are taking no identifiable student information. So if you, um, the protocol goes through um, what the teachers are asked. We do have a pre and post survey that we're asking the teachers to complete, but it's really just to give us feedback on the lessons um, and how they're working in the classroom. And then um, there's also a code for them to give each of their students a number for pre and post test to the state. We're looking at um, if there's differences between states and the um, maybe the geography standards that they have incorporated, but um, it still won't be attached to the schools at all. Um, and then they have um, an individual number, but this all the students are given letters. We are interested in their age and gender because there's also been known to be a gender difference with spatial reasoning. So we're kind of looking uh, interested in seeing if that um, holds true at certain ages and when they develop certain skills. So we are interested in their gender, but beyond that, um, we won't take any other information. The um, teachers can keep the unique identifier assigned to students so when we give the res, um, results back to them, if they want to identify where s their individual students are, the teachers can, but we won't have access to any of that information. So, um, and then I do have a sample assessment questions. I didn't give the whole, uh, um, give you copies of um, the entire assessment. There's 20 questions. There's four for each of those. Um, if we go back to each of these, I should have put this on there. Um, me, um, I went to the wrong place, sorry. Too far. So we have coordinates, bearings, measurement, area perimeter, and scale. We've got four questions for each of those. Two that are written strictly math-based, and then two that are written geography. So for like the angles, they would be asked just an angle question, but then in geography it would be associated with direction. 
And so just to see if there's a difference between if they, um, if they gain the mathematic knowledge versus the strictly spatial geographic knowledge and can compare those two. And so there's 20 questions total, but there's a sample in there. And then I've given each of you a copy of one of the lessons so that you can see how that looks. So do you have any questions? Are there any questions from the board? Naomi? I'll let the professor go first. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm going to ask a few nitpicky questions. So I want to make sure that first I say that this sounds like a wonderful project and a benefit to the school. So this has nothing to do with whether I think the children would benefit. I think it would be a wonderful thing to implement. But in my world, we do IRBs and consent and assent. And so I wanted to touch and ask a few things about that, if you don't mind. Um, the first would be to clarify, for those who don't know, um, being exempt from IRB is a good thing. <laughs> it sounds like it means there's no oversight, but um, an IRB approval under exempt status includes the full oversight. It just means it doesn't have to be vetted through all the same layers. It's approved sooner. Mm -hmm. And so that, that might be worth having for that. That said, though, um, the students are participants in this, in that the data is being collected directly from them even if it is anonymized and all of those pieces, it's not just asking for the teacher perspectives on it. And so I'm curious about your choice to leave out any assent aspect for the students themselves. Well, we, um, in the, this school has um, come on after the date in the initial proposal that we submitted to the IRB. We had every school and the administrators sign on and written in the approval was the assent that was given by the principal and the administrators from the school district, but we had one of the principals moved schools and mid-year and the new principal did not um, respond as far as being a participant in the research and so we needed to fill a third role. And um, Be um, Bev and Deb were, I'm sorry, Barb and Deb were um, really excited about the project and interested in it. And so I just out, you know, reached out to them and said, would you be interested in participating in the research um, element of that? So um, this school's being brought in after those initial assents were given from the administrators from your school. That makes perfect sense. It, would there be any easy or, or not too onerous way to add a step of assent? Again, um, to, to clarify for anybody for whom it's not, um, their world. In research, there are two layers. There's consent and assent. And consent is given by those who um, are in authority, such as the parent. And assent is given by anybody participating, whether they have the authority to consent or not. So if there's a certain kind of study, the parent consent does not mean that the student, the student still needs to assent, needs to be aware that they're participating in a study in certain circumstances. Uh, so I'm curious if you can think of any way that we could, that it might be doable without being too onerous to you to place that kind of layer within this. There is on on the front page of the um, assessment. There's a paragraph that says that the students are realizing that this is um, that they are participating. That this is used for the research, but there's a uh, it says we realize that you may not know the answers to some, many of these questions because you haven't done the activities yet, and that's okay. Um, just do the best that you can. So there is a paragraph. Um, I'm trying to think, I have to um, look, and there's no wording as far as by completing this, you're agreeing that your scores can be used as part of that, but we could add that very easily. Does unless it, it absolutely does, and unless the, the group feels that it's an unnecessary step, then I think it would be marvelous just to have that in there so that it's all, all the boxes are checked. Are there other questions? Cinda. Um, just a comment. I think it sounds like a neat opportunity for our students, um, and it covers, you know, some of the questions. You already covered some of the questions I would have asked about, you know, identifiable information. Um, <clears throat> I think that this creates a, a unique learning opportunity around a subject that I often feel, I think, at least in our country, in general, a generalized um, statement that sometimes geography is, you know, it's kids sometimes don't know, you know, where different countries are. Um, compared to other countries um, and how they learn those things. So it brings up another question, which is not to be answered today, but maybe for Mark is, you know, where in our curriculum, you know, K through 12, where, where are the key geography components that we're addressing and where do we pick it up again, drop it off, you know, what are the you know, standards, competencies and whatnot. But all in all, I think it sounds like a neat opportunity. Um, I thank you all for bringing it to us and 
um, it'll it would be neat um, to get some of the the post survey information as well I know I would really appreciate hearing how it went and um, I certainly support it when, when you said bring up where they bring in geography and where it's picked up and dropped off um, one of the teachers that um, was working with us last week when I brought her the rewritten lesson she said I can do this during math instead of having to try to fit it in during my topic time because just the way that the lesson was framed is it just fit really easily into the math side of it but they were still getting the geography piece in context yeah. so yeah no that's neat thank you Andy so some, <clears throat> something you said early uh, sort of piqued my interest it said math uh, math teachers or math is general didn't see the value of doing math as part of maps is how dated is that and is the advent of a lot of the concept of common core with more applied usage of math change that at all that comment was just from last semester because we we did those surveys um, before we submitted the um, initial proposal apologies to what go ahead is, is that what is that what your question was is when the teachers um, when we were looking at that as far as whether or not they applied? yeah I wanted to know how, how dated that comment was a couple weeks <laughs> <laughs> a few months <laughs> so I, I would just add that um, I, I think we're entering an era so you talk about Common Core and the college and career ready standards and um, we've talked about that for a long time and their value I think in our collective mind is the again the uh, application and content marriage and so I think that <clears throat> more and more teachers generally and certainly in our district are um, every day seeing alignments across content and I think that's getting more and more common and so an opportunity like this is going to make that much more um, relevant for for teachers and cause them those who haven't already started to make those cross-disciplinary connections more inclined to seek them so I think that's that's definitely our future right because for me I mean I was a math major in, in college um, my wife is a math department head in another school district um, this is what it's all about because you know being in scouts doing orienteering as, as a kid and things like that um, it, it, it disappointed me to hear that math didn't think that that was applicable because the usage of this as far as mathematics is what you would use every day when you when you uh, grow up and do realize things so um, I'm, I hope that we through our actions can maybe lead the charge to to change that perception because I think it's certainly the kind of thing that we need as part of the whole mathematics curriculum so that's I'm excited from that aspect All right, the questions from the board. Um, the only thing I would say is a follow-on comment to Naomi's uh, comment. If there's a way of integrating the language you were discussing, I, it, I don't think it would be, it would just add, not take away from. So if, if possible, that'd be great. Um, but with that, you know, whenever a study comes before the board that's being done in partnership with a third party, we as the board always get vetted. And I just, is there are any concerns, let us know. But if not, uh, by consensus, are we comfortable with allowing the study to go forward. With that, uh, we wish you all success with your study and just thank you again for finding new opportunities to find new learning platforms for our kids. It's great, so thanks for your time as well. Thank you. Thank you so much. Very excited about this. And now we're on to item number, sorry, four, which is canine in the schools and I will turn the mic over to Mark McLaughlin. Great, so is our uh, as our guests um, come to the table, uh, <clears throat> I will just, um, I'll introduce uh, them and then I'll just make a couple of opening remarks <clears throat> and then turn it over to, to those folks for some comments before we open it up to questions. I just want to uh, draw the board's attention um, to just a couple of things in terms of who's here and who's not. So I just want to uh, say to Mr. Zampieri, I'm really grateful he's here tonight, not feeling particularly well, and it was not my, uh, and it was, and it was not my understanding he was going to be here tonight. But uh, like the good team player that everybody is, uh, he's here. So we really thank Rich for that, and um, 
Also, uh, Ken Johnson and, and uh, Adam Carragher were not able to be here tonight, but they're well represented by their um, their associates. And um, and then Tom Prentice certainly works so closely with um, Adam Carragher, and Adam and Ken are both well aware of this. So their absence tonight means nothing other than that they literally just could not be here. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to just introduce from the left. I think most everybody knows who these folks are, but uh, Detective Tom Prentice. Uh, Detective Mike Murray, Chief Mark Doyle, Assistant Principal Peter Bergeron, and Assistant Principal Rich Zampieri. Um, before I just turn it over to these gentlemen um, for just, as I said, a few comments before the board um, opens to questions, um, I just want to I just want to sort of um, put a context in place here. About a year ago, when um, <clears throat> I think Mrs. Wolfline and, and Mrs. Hood brought the YRBS data to the board. Um, at that time, uh, they revealed some um, uh, responses that caused all of us to um, sit back and, and take a second look at uh, certain, uh, certain student perceptions as relates to substance and alcohol use and misuse. And, um, and so since that time, um, the district and the board have, we've really been doing a lot of thinking about um, how to um, respond to um, the need to address issues of substance use and abuse um, in our schools, but more broadly in our community. Um, and I think one of the things that we've really learned is that um, in any community where substance abuse occurs, um, it is incumbent on all partners to join together to try to address it, not just one entity. And so, in response to the YRBS results, we've tried to do a number of things in district proactively um, because one of the things that we um, have learned is that in all cases where uh, students misuse alcohol or drugs, um, they need education, information, and support. That's always true. And so um, we have, just in no particular order, but I would just say, um, we have um, the emergence of a mental health committee in district that I know the board is well familiar with. And one of the things that they've been doing a lot of work on is trying to identify the intersection between um, mental health and substance use and abuse. And there is a strong connection. That's been an intentional effort uh, on the part of the uh, district mental health committee, partly, not entirely, but partly in response to some of the um, findings off the way RBS. Off of the mental health work, um, we have learned uh, this phrase, um, uh, uh, students need helpers. And the idea is that um, whether you're a parent, uh, a citizen, um, a teacher, a counselor, a police officer, um, students need to know that there are helpers uh, in their community, people they can go to, not necessarily for the answer, but for a direction to an answer. So one of the things that we did um, in district is in October, we sponsored, uh, uh, along with Merrimack Safeguard, a, a concert. Uh, you might recall that I mentioned that back in October, and it was uh, a young talent, Nicole Michelle uh, from uh, Pelham, who is a singer, and um, she was like kind of the draw, but that night we had um, organizations from all over the, the um, the greater Nashua area representing helper agencies and helper organizations. Um, Bridges, um, the Merrimack Police Department, um, uh, various uh, health organizations from the greater Nashua uh, region, um, uh, just a, ver a number, um, just a number of uh, groups who were set up, um, set up tables and just described who they are and how they can be of service to students. Uh, and how they can be resources. That was attended by about 200 students and families, and it was a great night. And it wasn't just a concert; it was all, it was it was also a lot of information about who the helpers are. Um, board members uh, Schneider and Gualiumi, um, uh also at one point um, had discussed the power of a community forum um, as a way to help the community to recognize that um, issues of substance use and abuse are not just, again, one entity's problems. And so we, um, several weeks ago at the John O'Leary Center, hosted a community forum 
and again, uh, it was um, there was a panel of uh, faith leaders, um, business, police. Uh, Chief Doyle was there, um, education, uh, and others to speak about how different sectors in our community take responsibility for a piece of the challenge that is substance uh, misuse in our community. In addition to that, on that night, again, we had a number of um, vendors and organizations set up, church groups, business groups, substance abuse uh, 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 prevention specialists, mental health groups, um, uh, recovery groups, all of whom were there specifically to show that they are helpers and to help parents and community members know that they exist. And so, um, and so we've really tried to do a comprehensive job of response to the YRBS to um, bring the community um, a focus on this issue. So now it brings us to tonight. Um, one of the um, tools among many that we have explored and will continue to explore is um, the issue of the introduction of a canine in uh, Merrimack Middle School and Merrimack High School. Um, and so tonight, you are able to see in your packet a description of uh, the expectation um, between the Merrimack Police Department and the district around the implementation of that potential tool. And, um, and, and so I, I, I introduce that as part of the fuller context of the variety of things that we've been trying to do in our district to address the issue this just being one piece of it. So with that context said, I, I might just turn it over to um, Chief Doyle and maybe uh, uh, Mr. Bergeron initially and then invite others to speak just to kind of uh, set it up and then we'll be happy to have the board ask questions. I appreciate that. Thank you, uh, Mark, and um, good evening, everyone, and certainly thank you for having us here tonight to discuss this. And as Mark stated, that this has been something that collectively we've talked about um, for the better part of about a year and a half or almost two years now, I think formally, and that discussion has kind of been an undercurrent for a number of months and or a year or so before that even. So uh, what brings us here tonight is to really, I think, explore the opportunity. And I look at it as an opportunity a little bit more in depth. And we had a conversation several months ago with Board Member Gualiumi and uh, Schneider uh, relative to this to kind of bring out some of the more salient points about what it is that I think folks would want to be attentive to and as well as the folks uh, at the school district would want us to be attentive to when it comes to conducting a search in the schools. Um, notwithstanding the legal and constitutional guidelines that are established and we won't, certainly won't dig into those, you could probably spend an entire semester at law school talking about school searches and the legalities and the constitutionality of that. Um, Suffice it to say that as long as they're conducted in the constitutional way that they're supposed to be conducted, they're constitutional and constitutionally valid, uh, and therefore have provided us with great direction on how to conduct them in such a way that um, we're not, I don't want to say trampling on the rights of the individuals that we're sworn to protect and, and serve, uh, but we're protecting those rights at the same time that we're doing these kinds of searches and inquiries. Uh, there is a lot that goes along with it procedurally, and I can dig into that a little bit more as well. Um, but suffice it to say, in, in just to piggyback on what Assistant Superintendent McLaughlin spoke about, about the agreement, the protocol that we're trying to establish, what you have in front of you, I believe, is just a snapshot of really what our ongoing memorandum of understanding relative to the Safe Schools Act, that's one R RSA 193-D, uh, has put in place for us. And that uh, was something that Superintendent Chaffrey and I signed way back in 2011, which is still in full force and effect today. And basically what it boils down to, and just to kind of bring you up to speed with what those kind of restrictions, and I say not restrictions, but requirements are on a part of both the school district and the police department are that there are certain things that require reporting to the police department. Uh, those include possession, sale, distribution of illegal drugs and prescription drugs without a prescription on school property, uh, that the requirement is bestowed upon the principal and or his designee to notify the police and the student's parents and inform them of the nature of the incident once it comes to their attention. Uh, and that the police shall take appropriate action to initiate the formal complaint process. And what I'm trying to say is that nowhere in the MOU and nowhere in that protocol does it dictate and suggest or otherwise mandate that the police must take some kind of enforcement action. It just doesn't exist. What it does do is it establishes a, 
uh, an informal network, if you will, of a relationship and a partnership that we have had formed and is solid and has been since I've been chief anyway and before that, and something that we'll continue to reinforce and build upon. More importantly, what it also says is that we work together, which is, I think, goes hand in hand with the partnership that we've had and really doesn't have to be spelled out in a document, but it gives us some guidelines in terms of what the MOU requires us to do and what the Safe Schools Act requires us to do. Now, having said that, what we're trying to say or what I'm trying to say is notwithstanding whatever it is that we do or whatever the discovery it is that happens at the school, whether it's by one of our school resource officers or whether it's by the folks at the school, a teacher or a faculty member, the same protocol will be followed meaning that they will notify us or we will notify them. We will talk at length about what it is that needs to be done. Each case will be looked at uniquely and, in, and differently and individually based upon the individual, the student, the history, uh, the nature of the contacts that the school district has had. Nothing out of what we're currently doing with those kinds of situations. I entrust that decision-making authority on our end, at least in the initial stages, upon our school resource officers at the middle school, Tommy Prentice, and at the high school, Mike Murray. Uh, they know what the memorandum of understanding requires. They know explicitly what it is that the school district does. They know that, and they entrust, I don't want to speak on their behalf, but I'm certainly sure that they entrust the school district faculty in both of those schools and in all the schools, the elementary schools included, to uh, take appropriate measures where they see appropriate. Uh, the discipline, the school consequences that are handed out at the school district level are something that we feel comfortable with when they're done and they're done in a, in a responsible manner. And we've had no reason to believe that they're not, meaning that we're never going to be in a position, nor should we be in a position where we're going to second guess those decisions. There may, however, become instances or occurrences where the school district has to rely upon us for our professional opinion regarding whatever other mitigating circumstances are in play or uh, whatever other aggravating circumstances might be in play that might so-and-so up the ante, where we need to actually physically bring somebody into the court system to get them a referral. Remember, all of our goal, or our entire goal here is, and our objectives are, to make sure that the folks who need the services that they need get the services that they need. And there are a number of ways to do that. Sometimes it's informally outside of the court system. Sometimes we've got to bring them into the formal system to make sure that those services are bestowed upon them in a more structured manner. Um, but instead of just digging deep into what it is that we would do, and I can certainly answer those questions if they do come up procedurally about what the canine search is and how that's conducted, um, really that's kind of like the 30,000 foot level perspective and I, I wanted to make sure that you understand that the takeaway here is to really know that the partnership that we have, myself and Mark, myself and Marge, the school faculty and me and the school resource officers uh, and the different faculty and leadership teams around the school district is solid uh, and we respect each other's opinion uh, without any question, without any um, um, suggestion of other interference and it would never be that. We need to make sure that we're working collectively and together to make sure that our, our ultimately our mission which is the safeguarding of all the people in the community and the mission of the school is to uh, make sure that they provide a safe and secure learning environment for the students and the faculty that are there, that those missions are accomplished and the way to do that is to work jointly on these kinds of issues. Um, when Mark and I had spoken originally about the, the canine and, um, again, notwithstanding the, the, the political dis discussion that went on behind the scenes about what was going on and whether it was a great thing or a bad thing, um, the bottom line is that we wanted to make sure that folks understand that this wasn't just a police movement, that this just wasn't a school movement, that this just wasn't um, an issue that needed to be addressed by either the police or the school or the police and the school, that this is a community-wide thing. And, and when we speak about these issues at Safeguard, for example, we talk a lot about those different sectors. And, and the beauty of it was when we had our community forum the other night and we spoke a lot about some of the resources that were available. We had the faith-based organizations. We had the youth groups. The Boy Scouts were there. The Girl Scouts were there. We had a number of social services and, and agencies that were available. So you could actually see that there was a lot of pull there and a lot of support in and around the area. The challenge becomes, and I think you'll agree, the challenge becomes is identifying the people that need it and getting them to the point where they can connect with it. Um, if this is something that happens to expedite that move it in the right direction, then uh, hey, I'm all for it. And uh, I, I think the school district would be too. Again, with regard to making sure that people's rights uh, are protected, and the way to do that is to make sure that we're compliant with the way that the Constitution is written, both at the state and the federal level, and to make sure that the guidelines that are put in place are constitutionally valid.
Well, that was well said, Chief Doyle, and I would, uh, the administration, faculty, and staff would echo uh, everything he said. You know, our primary concern is for the safety and well-being of uh, each and every student at the high school. Um, obviously, there are times when we have to give consequences, but, you know, we, we would like to think that we educate our students each and every day, and some of those choices that they make are poor, uh, but, you know, we would like to think that we are there uh, for them. I think having, you know, this past spring when Sergeant Walters came to both the middle school and high school, I think that was more of an education piece and not like, you know, I, I got gotcha you moment. Uh, it was just to educate them and let them know, you know, uh, the purpose of having a canine dog come into the school. And we're, um, anybody would like to ask any questions, uh, certainly. Okay, uh, the first thing I probably would do is want to frame out your presentation tonight. Uh, the one thing that we want to acknowledge is 40% of the board is different. 60% uh, or actually half the board if you take into account our student rep is also different. So for you know half the people at this table, uh, this is definitely what you would call new information, although for, for the other half of us it's recurring. Um, with that, I think you know as we've gone over the years, last year's youth risk behavior survey was sobering. Is the right word there were there was data in there that um, gave us pause and said that we can't that we definitely can't look at status quo as the way to go and I know safeguard has taken steps in that area but you know we are we have a day-to-day -day operational issue we have to make sure that we as a board are cognizant to address um, I don't think there's there's definitely not an intent to make a decision tonight I would have to say but the things that um, are important is that Mike and Naomi, and I'm not putting it on the spot, but did you know about um, the data that came out of last year's Youth Risk Behavior Survey? And you have access to it? I know with the new website, I just want to make sure that if you need to get copies of that, you have it. Um, but it was really one of the most, I think, you know, humbling board meetings that we had in a very long time. And from that did come those visits. Um, when it comes to this issue, I think it's something that our constituents have reached out to us in both support and opposition of having the dogs in schools for, for various reasons. But I think what's important to say is that it would have to be very um, profound data to make you take what I would call a, a drastic step. You know, it's, it's definitely about education and, and child protection. Um, I know, you know, my son is a freshman this year, and I bring him up as an example that he shares a locker with someone he really doesn't know. Um, they don't have a lock because they don't know each other even, and he's had stuff come and go in his locker he doesn't identify. So, you know, we always worry about that whole, and that's the concern I've heard from parents is that entrapment, that these kids, a lot of them don't have locks on their lockers, and that you could, a kid could throw um, undesirable material into other kids' lockers. That's not what this is about. Um, creating that kind of environment. And I'll even co go back to Jake Marcus last year, who worried about the cultural impacts that would come from having um, the dog in the schools and what would that do to the dialogue with um, Detective Murray and those kind of things. But I think that, you know, if there was a concern of that, then I think he would be um, front and center to, to share it. But he's here, I think, to, to talk about what we should do to move forward. And, and to me, that says a lot. So with that, um, I definitely want to open it up for questions and, and comments from the board, but I just wanted to kind of frame it up of what's expected. And as, as we choose to, as we readdress this topic, I think we as a board are compelled to do something to kind of put to rest our position on what we feel about things like canines in the schools, because we can't keep discussing it and not come to a conclusion about this. Um, it's, it's not fair to... Uh, the police department either who's who's taking their time every year to come to us to talk about the pros and cons that they haven't changed year to year so uh, with that I'll open it up to the floor are there any questions or comments from the board Michael and Cinda's next I think okay okay Thank you. Uh, first, thank you very much for coming thank tonight uh, I appreciate the additional information that you provided um, I, I have a grave concern just because of the sheer fact that it's public domain within the school. Um, so that meaning that the, the locker is not an individual's locker, it actually is the school's uh, locker. Um, so for, for me, it leaves open a, a very wide door for many different things. And I, I, I kind of heard 
you saying that it's not there to prosecute an individual. There's steps before that. Um, I guess for me to kind of get behind this, I would need to be, I would need to feel comfortable with, with that process and fully understand it and, and even know what that circumstances is. Cause, I, and I give you an example and maybe this is not even relevant, but if you have four people in a car and one of them has a bag of drugs on them, do all four people in the car get prosecuted or brought in or, or something? How does, how's that? Yeah, that's an excellent point because when it comes to those kinds of situations, and I don't want to speak on behalf of the, the, the school district, but I would imagine they exercise the same level of discretion <clears throat> when it comes to those, those gray areas. Believe you me, when it comes to those kinds of situations, they're all gray areas. Uh, but it's incumbent upon us to do our due diligence. Number one, the, the, the ultimate goal here would be if we do encounter that locker that has maybe two or three kids that are sharing it and there uh, is contraband in the locker, we found the contraband and now it is being removed, number one, and that's our goal. Secondly, is if we need to do the deep dive and figure out through an investigation, either by virtue of having our school resource officers work on that in conjunction with the school staff, that's, and that's what we're going to do. We'll get to the bottom of it if it's at all possible. Uh, and that entails some legwork on our part. Uh, but it will depend on a number of factors, who the parties are, and again, looking at each individual situation uniquely uh, to make that determination of whether the, uh, the effort is uh, necessary, uh, who the persons are, whether we have a history with each and every one of them or any of them, uh, and then move forward, not unlike we would do in that same kind of scenario that you just kind of presented where we have an officer that stops a car with four people in it and there happens to be marijuana. Um, in and of itself, I mean, that one snapshot would uh, give us enough to bring a criminal charge against the driver of the vehicle because he and or she are the ones who are uh, overly in charge of the operation and the contents of the vehicle at any time, notwithstanding who it was that actually possessed it and left it in plain view or otherwise. Um, but lockers are different, and uh, lockers aren't open all the time. And if we have a dog that's going to alert on a locker, the dog doesn't know who owns the locker. The police don't know who owns the locker, or who, I say, owns it, but who is entrusted with it for that brief period of time. And it's only until they go into that locker and find whatever's in there that's causing the dog to, dog to alert on it um, would take us to that next step. But again, ultimately, we're finding contraband in it, and we're removing it, whether we follow up with a criminal complaint afterwards or whether the school decides to go with school consequences afterwards would be a discretionary judgment made upon the information that we have at hand um, and whether we could do any more fact-finding after it as well. The comment. I just wanted to enter. Um, if it's about the comment, I'll let you close that's the comment okay. and I'll let you follow up on your question with. Well, it's about that comment. Okay. That oh, you go ahead. Then go ahead, Michael. So, so I, I just want to make a comment on the, the removal. I mean, that's one of the reasons that I'm, I'm actually on the fence just to kind of put it out there but I think the the key there is the removal of the drugs and that's one of the things that I think is a great benefit um, of this tool so but thank you for and I'll let others comment. Cinda? Yeah I wanted to say that when Andy and, um, and Mark and I had met with the chief last fall um, you know we initially started talking and said okay we want to make sure we have it really clearly stated what's going to happen when you know, if this happens, so it's there's very clear protocols, and um, and I think what we came up with is there really is that gray area, there really is that discretion that is not unlike what's being done right now. Um, you know, just because the dog is not there doesn't mean there aren't situations that have to be handled really in the same manner that they would be handled if they were found by the dog. There's still that doesn't change those protocols that currently exist. It doesn't change the way the school resource officers work with the students and the family um, and so on and so forth. So that was kind of a, an aha moment, at least for me, um, when we had that discussion. Um, I don't know if Mark or Andy want to add anything to that. Okay. Okay. Um, so that's, I just wanted to follow up on that because your question really reminded me of kind of some of the earlier discussions that we had around the topic. Yeah. Uh, no, I, I appreciate that. I think that this is two separate scenarios. One is possibly being caught in the act or something like that versus actually, you know, proactively pursuing. So 
I think they're they're two different scenarios to start off with, so therefore it's a little bit different for me. So okay. if I could just you know make a comment, you know, every case is so different. They they really are. No two cases are the same. And many times uh Rich and myself, and Mr. Johnson, we, we can handle many of these cases on our own. There are times, though, where we do need the assistance of a school resource officer, and they've always been there for us. But, you know, immediately, too, we, we like I started out at the beginning, we worried about, we were always worrying about the safety and well-being of uh, our students. You know, if, we, if a student's under the influence, we're going to get the school nurse involved. Parents are going to be contacted uh, immediately. So a lot of uh, forces come together for that student. Uh, but there are certainly, uh, uh, you know, some gray areas. And then there's certainly uh, some cases that, you know, uh, happen pretty quickly. And, you know, I, I think it's a matter of we know our students. And our students also will go to not only uh, Mrs. Ampieri or myself or Mr. Johnson, but you know, our school resource officer, he's been with us for 17 years, so students have a pretty good rapport, a very good rapport, I should say, with uh, Detective Murray. Um, I think Andy had a comment to weigh in on that, and then, um, and then we have some questions on the other end as well. So as, as Cindy and, and Shannon have said, that I've, I've been sort of involved from the beginning in the discussions on these with both through Safeguard and as well as uh, with individual discussions. I know that a year ago when this, a little over a year ago when the subject was first broached, there was a lot of pushback um, um, from this, you know, from Jake as well as um, um, I think even Principal Johnson at the time talked about the trust, the issue of uh, bringing, um, you know, canines into schools for the purpose of, of searching to see what's there. A lot of angst by uh, voters and things around, and, and especially parents about um, sort of the word accusatory. The word, you know, uh, they search the lockers, they find something. My my son or daughter is going to get blamed for something they didn't do. They'll get set up. It, that was the mindset that that a lot of people had a year ago. After seeing the youth, uh, the the behavior uh, survey as well as a lot of what we've seen around a lot of the, the opioid crisis in the state, I'm getting the impression that it isn't so much the, the blame and, and finding a person, taking them out and dealing with them like a lot of parents would think about. It's really about making sure the school is safe to make sure that it searches so that the rest of the students can feel safe that those things aren't there. And you, you, you said a couple of times, um, Chief, about removal. Removal is the key part. And for me, when I think about it, the dealing with the student or finding out the student is like third or fourth down the list. It's really making the area safe, understanding what's there, making, making us feel comfortable or making the students feel comfortable that it's a safe area, that those things aren't there. Because it isn't so much selling or anything like that. It's if a friend, you know, is, is OD'd or on something in school and they collapse and hurt themselves, what it does to their friends and the other students around, it's extremely traumatic to see something like that happen. So um, it's, it's changed my perspective a bit over the last year just seeing what the state has done, um, you know, what has happened in the state, you know, the, uh, the benefits of the, um, the, the fire stations and sort of that safe location to go. Um, so for me, the, the key would be is if we decide as a district to go this route, that it's really the removal and the identification and the sort of validating the safe area for our students is the number one thing. And then we talk about education. I mean, for me, I would like that memo of understanding is really strong because it, it really calls about educating and dealing and not, and, and, and prosecution or arrest is like the 85th thing down the list that you deal with. It's really working to find the help and to understand what's there and, and even punishment or, or, circumstance or uh, repercussions is way down the list. It's really the awareness and the helping and the education. So I think one of the things that if we as a board decide to go this route, I think the socializing of that educational aspect, the socializing of the MOU and, and sort of the way that we as a district want to do to go hand in hand with the way that we did the community thing. Well, we didn't talk about blaming, you know, oh, we got this really bad drug problem. It's rather 
here's the places where help is there for those that need it. So for families that need it, for friends that, that know this, those are the places that help is there. Non-accusatory, but more, more like solving the problem. It gets right to the point of the, the AOK -okay program and safeguard. Ask for help, offer help, keep it going. It's really about socialization to make the peers want to help, want to be part of the pro solution rather than just the police coming in with dogs or things. So that's sort of, I, I just wanted to get that out. Uh, Zev, uh, I'll go Zev, Naomi, then Cinda. Kind of okay, uh, Cinda, then I'll just jump to Zev okay. after that. <laughs> it's kind of a continuation. Um, there's a few of us here that are at Safeguard. Mm -hmm. And when the youth risk behavior um, survey results came out, you know, last year, as you, we discussed, it was very sobering. Um, and, you know, Safeguard is weighed in that, you know, they are supportive of the dog if it's part of a comprehensive plan. Um, if that's, is that, that's my understanding, is that um, they will support it as long as it is part of the overall. It's not the end all be all, it's not the answer, which of course makes sense. Um, and so I think over the last year, I think the district has made a lot of progress in kind of the overall support and help of our students. What's going on um, with the mental health committee is huge. Um, I'm really um, just excited about the work that they're doing and how they are working to um, be able to get the resources that we have um, or possibly even more resources out into as many kids as possible to be able to help them and I think it's really powerful stuff. In fact, um, Allie McKnight who is in Safeguard as well, I recall she had explained it, um, that she had a radio interview. Um, she is with the Nevet, uh, Nashua Division of Public Health and Community Services and she had explained in a radio interview that it's a best practice um, that she believes is something that other districts should be doing in the way that we are handling this mental health committee. Um, she's very impressed by it. Um, so I think that um, when we look at the dog and we look at some of the community events and potentially some future things as well, we are looking at, again, to reiterate what Andy said, you know, ways of supporting our students, ways of being able to get them help when they need it, um, and that this is not overall comprehensively an I got you moment. It's about um, helping people and being able to put them in touch with the right resources and get support for them. Um, the, the other thing I wanted to reiterate was um, prior to this last, this year, there was just one representative from the school board on safeguard. Um, when the youth risk behavior survey results came out, we did kind of a double down approach as well um, by having both Andy and I on safeguard um, to be able to bring more resources and be able to um, further strengthen the relationship that we have um, you know, with safeguard. And there was one other thing I wanted to um, bring up. I think Mark and Andy, there was a document about the top five things schools can do. Um, and I think that that's a document that we wanna make sure that we distribute to the school board here as well. Um, again, continuing to focus on just the comprehensive things that we can do across the board. So we're not looking at, there's no one answer. There's no one thing that we can do in a vacuum. Um, and it's exactly this relationship that we have with the police department, um, with other community organizations and safeguard and the business community, all of the um, groups that were at the event that was just recently held um, that will continue, I think, to drive us forward. Okay, Zev, then Naomi, and we'll go around the table with more rounds of questions. Uh, so I've heard a number of you guys talk about the Solman results of the student at risk survey and I completely understand why you guys would um, obviously be concerned with the results. I mean, <coughs> I think we should all be concerned with these results, but I think it's important to remember that unfortunately, unfortunately there are a lot of kids in the high school that don't take these tests seriously when they, when they're being conducted. And I know like personally many kids who didn't answer these truthfully just because they don't, they, again, they don't really take these things seriously. So, I mean, I'm all for. Um, eliminating drugs at all costs and creating a safe environment for all the students. So I'm, I'm completely for all the, the steps we've taken um, to counter drugs and all these things on our campus. But I think it is important to remember that a lot of these surveys may be skewed a little bit because people don't take them seriously. Um, additionally, I think that my position on this differs from uh, past Representative Marcus and a lot of other people that um, voice their apprehension towards having a dog on campus because of the tension it could create with 
um, the police. I disagree that it'll, and I, I disagree. I think that it could create possibly some tension, but I think the student's relationship with the police officer on campus is a pretty positive one. I think it, additionally it's important to remember that uh, this dog isn't here and the police aren't here to persecute innocent kids and that there really is no danger of of kids that aren't involved with drugs actually being incriminated for any charges against this and there clearly is a good framework for this program and there really is again I don't think parents should be worried about uh, anything happening to their kids if they aren't involved in drugs I think that in general the community seems to have this visceral reaction towards having this dog on campus and I think that it's completely unjustified and it's clear that any I, I personally think that any steps that are being taken to creating a better environment for the students that are our, our high school is, is a positive one so I commend you all on this um, on this course of action Mark, you had a comment to follow on, Zev? No, I just, I, I, I want to just comment on um, Zev, what you were saying in terms of the reliability of the student responses. It's an excellent point, and I'm glad you raised it because I, I, it raises an important point about the degree to which we use that um, result um, for policy making or even protocol making. So I just would say that um, the, um, because it's a formal study, um, there are, in the ways that the formal survey and in the ways that the questions are um, created and the way that the questions are um, assessed, accounts for that level of variability. So for over-reporting and under-reporting, um, it, it kind of takes that into account. But because of that very fact, um, the, the federal agencies who require us to, um, or who, who strongly encourage us to, um, to uh, grant recipients to use that, um, tell us that um, we have to be very careful not to make policy off of those results. So they're instructive, they're informative, they're attempting to um, develop a generalized um, picture from the eyes of students, but um, we are in, supposed to be um, cautiously skeptical, um, which doesn't mean that they're not valid, but it means that they, we, they are not strong enough that we would ever make policy on it. Recommendations, yes. So I just wanted to make that point because it's, it's very important to, to raise. And as, as long as I could, if I could just say, um, <clears throat> one of the things that you've heard, uh, Julie DeLuca, uh, who's one of the co-chairs of the Mental Health Committee, uh, you, uh, say you've heard it once, you've heard it a, a hundred times, she talks about systems of care and support. That's, a, that's, a, that's like a slogan almost coming out of the Mental Health Committee, trying to develop systems of care and support. And, um, and nothing, and I was, uh, gratified to hear uh, Board Member Schneider say that, uh, or uh, I think uh, Board Member Gualiumi as well, nothing about the introduction of this tool changes um, the protocols that are already in place. Our goal remains systems of care and support. If a student is struggling for whatever reason um, with substance, um, the earlier we can determine um, Oh, the, the, earlier, the, the more tools we can put into place to remove the substance and then secondarily to create a system of care and support in the school, um, the, the better off and the more healthy we're going to be. So it's just a carryover from the work of the Mental Health Committee. Just want to put that phrase out because you're going to hear it a lot, a lot. <laughs> Thanks. Naomi. Um, thank you very much um, for being here and talking about it. And I'm, I'm very cognizant that I'm coming late to the conversation, so some of this may be repetitive, but I, I certainly um, bow to the experience that has already been brought to this bef before I'm entering it. Uh, my own perspective is evolving on this one and still is, but there are a couple of things that occur to me to put into the conversation. Um, the first one is that this isn't an instance of there being no contraband in a school. There are very sc few schools in the world that could say that with accuracy. And so it's not a choice between a school free of contraband and with no dog, or one with contraband and with or without a dog. What we're really asking is whether or not to leave substances in the hands of students because we're concerned that students might um, be blamed for something in relation to if it's found. And so the counterpoint to that is would parents Take a hypothetical child um, who has contraband placed in their locker. Would a parent prefer that their child be permitted to keep that substance in the name of not blaming them for something? Or would they rather that that substance be removed and it handled and dealt with in a way that might be briefly uncomfortable for the child while it's explored, but removes that from, from the school? Um, 
for me that removal becomes incredibly important in that regard. I would like to know more if there's an opportunity about the ways that other schools and districts have handled the cons, because we are not the first to talk about this, and whether they have found that um, it ends up leading to more um, arrests or other ways of, of, of discipline outside the school setting for students, or whether it does not, and those types of pieces, I think that might help lay to rest the idea that it brings that in. So do we have any understanding of how other districts have handled uh, the dog in the school finding things and, and how they've processed it? Are there baselines in neighboring school districts? I know Litchfield uses, I believe, Nashua does. Nashua, Alvern, uh, Litchfield. Manchester. <coughs> Milford. I'll turn it over to Bedford. Bedford just recently did as well. I'll turn it over to Officer Murray to let him know. Or yeah, I think he can, you've had some conversation with some of the other uh, of your colleagues in other schools who have had similar. Yeah, as far as that specific question, I, I think. As far as that specific question is, I think, in general, it's handled administrative only. There's no criminal charges. Um, and I've, I've been sitting on my hands here during this, so I, if, I, if this is my opportunity, then so be it. If it's not, I apologize. But I think this is a very um, uh, a great tool. I think it's a crystal clear message from the school board to the public that um, schools are not a place for drugs. So if this is a, a tool to get drugs out of school and uh, it's fairly effective. The other thing you guys really need to know is there is about 900 lockers at the high school. Um, so if you double up, that's 1,800 kids. We, don't have, we have 1,200 kids. So there are a significant amount of empty lockers. So if I'm a drug dealer and I'm assigned locker 100, I'm not putting my drugs in locker 100. Because if the dogs come through, and, and uh, I'm good. They hit. They go bombing right by 100. I stick my drugs in locker 1300. So if the dogs come through, they get my drugs, and I'm out of business. Um, I think. I think the thing to think about is the the seems like the mindset would be administrative only. The dog can can key on in heroin and opiates, which are killing kids. Um, it's early intervention for for a freshman. I can tell you there's a freshman in Merrimack that's involved in the theft of a gun, who's heavily involved in drugs, involved in the theft of a gun recently. I can tell you that same person was involved in a drug rip. It was basically car A pulls up with drugs, car B pulls up to buy, they get in car A, and they pull out a gun and they steal the drugs. So there's a significant amount of um, drugs in our school, and just like any other school in America, I think. The schools in our in our general area have done these searches. I think um, we got to ask ourselves why we're not. Um, and and I, I think it, it's a very soft pedal thing. It's a, it's a administrative only. Basically, the general general feeling is that there'd be no criminal charges. I think um, it helps get rid of the drug. There's 800 cars up there on a daily basis. Alvin did a did a search. Um, they did the school. They found very very little. They had some police there, they said, well, let's walk around the cars. They found a gun in the car. So it had nothing to do with drugs, but certainly a safety issue. You have 800 cars, an extra pair of eyes. Um, I think, if you don't know, I think they bring in four or five dogs at a time. They go in a lockdown, the dogs bomb through. One dog can't do it because the nose desensitized. So you bomb four or five dogs through in about 20 minutes, said and done, and moving on to your school day. I think much what... Um, our great rep had said, I think the, the kids at the high school, um, this has been talked about, they're, the good kids are applauding it, the bad kids are knowing it's coming, they're not getting blindsided, this is, this is a, um, we've talked about it, if they still want to bring drugs there, then shame on them. Um, I really see no way or no, no reason to hesitate on this matter, I mean, I, I think it's a... I don't, I've, I've been a policeman a long time. If I have to arrest a kid at the high school, it's a bad day for both of us. I don't want to arrest anybody else. I'd rather educate them. I get calls all the time from parents. I think my kid's smoking dope. So I pull up to power school, the grades are tanking. I wouldn't say marijuana is a, I'd say marijuana is the most significant drug. I wouldn't say it's a gateway to heroin. Maybe, may not be. But I would say it, it's, a, it's taking you off your track. It's a dropout drug. It's taking you off, your tra off the course. So. 
I think, again, clear and consistent message from us as adults is because God knows what they're getting from, from home, what the message is from home. Maybe the parents are smoking with them. So we're saying, no, not in our school. So probably said too much, but Honestly, I, I'm, I here, I'm here for, I, I mean, if you have any questions, yep. you want to know, um, the kids talk to me a lot. I mean, I think we have pretty good rapport. Um, I, I worry about them. I worry about their weekends, and I worry that the, the spillover is, is into our schools. So I think we need to push back. And actually, I think your comment's just right because we always worried about how it was going to affect you doing your job in the school, and you're saying that it's going to make it better, not worse. And so that's important to us. Yeah, I, I, th I think there's no surprises for me. The kids know I, I support a dog search, and, and they, that doesn't make them hate me. That, uh, it, that tells them I care about them. Mm -hmm. so. Andy? So, let's see, what she was talking spatial earlier left right so to your right um is the resource officer from the middle school so detective prentice the discussion was in the way it was teed up is that this would be something at both schools to be able to be done so what's your perspective from a middle school um <clears throat> i feel the same as mike uh i'm in i'm in favor of the dog uh coming into the school just for the um the case of just getting rid of the drugs as he said it's all administrative and Chief, you can probably correct me, but and I don't want to refer to us as canines, but the, the same discussion was probably when the first SRO went into the school. You know, is it going to be entrapment? Is he going to be writing tickets left and right? Is there going to be arrests? Uh, this is just a tool that, that's out there for us to use like anything else in the school. Um, we're in the school already, and as Mike said with the rest, that, I mean, that's our last, that's our last resort. Um, when an incident comes to the, the principal or uh, the assistant principal, it's, you know, they talk with me, they talk with the guidance counselor, there's a behavioral specialist, um, along with the parents, and way out to the right is that, that, you know, if we have to, you know, involve the courts. And as the chief pointed out earlier, in some cases, that's the only avenue we have for assistance um, that we can get these kids when they, you know, when they get into the juvenile justice system. Um, but uh, overall, um, it, it's just, I, I, it's a tool, and we have a lot of tools at schools, and there's no reason not to be able to uh, use this one. Cinda? Um, I just wanted to state that I went to both assemblies last year. I went, uh, there was an assembly at the middle school as well as the high school. Um, first of all, it was very impressive. Um, I just enjoyed it, you know, personally, for one. Secondly, it seemed to be very well received, and more importantly, you know, by the students. There was a lot of interest and questions regarding the training of the dog. The dog is beautiful. Um, and you, they were just literally on like the edges of their seats and um, there seemed to be just interest and um, there certainly weren't any questions that I wouldn't expect. It was literally all about the training of the dog, where he lives, what he eats, what he, literally seeing this dog as really what he is, a dog. And so it was fascinating to see the demonstration, and um, I was really happy with how those assemblies went. Michael? First, I'd like to thank you both for your, your comments. Definitely appreciate that. Um, I had just had a question for you. So this has to be approved by the school board in order to go into effect. Is that correct? It does. Okay. And could the school board put something into effect where maybe we approve it for this year and we do a review after it's done in the school year? To renew it is that a possibility we can do anything we we choose what i would say to that though is that whenever circumstances change we change circumstances so when a policy needs adjustment we adjust policy and that's kind of our thing to do as a board anyway so um what we should do as a board is and it'd be my recommendation is we put it into effect without a, an expiration date and if we find that, um, and we basically invite back to gather data on effective, the effectiveness of the use of the dog, you know, when it is put into place. Because again, if we find that the dog is not needed, he's not going in. We find that there's a, a time and a place where it seems appropriate, he does go in. And when he does go in, we can do a, a debrief um, from those who were involved on, on what, what actually came about and um, what they were looking to get, what they got out of the, the uh, the 
effort and, and what adjustments need to be made. And if adjustments need to be made, do we need to do anything with our, um, with our documentation to, to um, adjust it accordingly? But to have something expire, it just, it's something that I, I, as a, I would not recommend based on our experience with um, policy review and that some of them are almost 20 years old. So if one expires, I would, I would hate to think that we would let it expire and, and not uh, have the bandwidth to be able to keep going with it. So that would be my, my personal recommendation. But uh, it takes three to, to have a policy, so that's three to make a vote, so. Cinda? One other thing I would add is, um, as we're looking at some of the other tools and the other things that are, we're putting in place in the district, is that we're proactive, not reactive. You know, I think the last thing this board wants is all of a sudden a major thing to go down and now all of a sudden we have to run and do all sorts of reactive strategies, not to say that those won't ever happen, but I feel much better and feel it's more in line with my duty to be proactive about these types of things rather than reactive. Michael? I just want to follow up on my comment because as I stated, I was kind of on the fence. I'm leaning a little bit one, more towards one way, but I would personally think that I could get behind it if it was proposed that it was for this school year and during the summer we re revisited after a review if it ha if you guys did that um, so I'm just going to put that out there as a as a board member I think I would feel comfortable with that and then we would review it in the summer after maybe Chief Doyle and everybody comes back and says what might have happened if we do it between then and now and then and then review it at that time to either go forward with it at that point so just kind of putting that out there thanks okay. And I actually did have a question that I put on my paper and haven't asked yet, which is, um, it's on Richen. Um, what percentage of lockers don't have view of security cameras? Because now we've talked a lot about security cameras and how they're effective tools for you in, in running the school. I wouldn't be able to give you an exact figure. Some of the uh, lockers are clearly in sight. Some down the hall a little further may not be as visible to be able to identify whether it's 1236 or 1238 per se. And there are some hallways that might be f not fully covered. Um, for an exact uh, number of lockers, we'd have to go back and do a review and, and sort of do an analysis of um, very good, good, poor visibility and, and to give you a more accurate uh, figure. Pete, you have no, you know, just just uh, Mr. Zampieri is right that you know some of some of the uh, you know the views are very very accurate. We have four, for example, we have like four cameras in the cafeteria. You know, we have exterior cameras. We have like forty three cameras, and and there are certain some years we work with Tom Tuso and we change the location of those cameras. Uh, that I mean, it's an invaluable uh, tool that you know we use probably. If not every day, it seems like every other day, you know, and then some days we're using the cameras, you know, several times, several times a day. But, you know, some of the uh, the views are not, you know, what I would say, uh, you know, good enough to, to really, you know, get a good view of, you know, what we need to see. And to that note, I know that we are in the rear view with our budget, but with what we're learning from this process in 1819, this is definitely something that would play into if you feel you need to expand. Um, this is the kind of data that would probably make that uh, that argument for you. Um, so as we go into budgets next year, I think some of these conversations tonight and, and what happens from them may play into uh, some goals that we may have as, as a district and, and you know to help support you in making a more secure and, and uh, comprehensive view of your school. So if you find that more are ne needed, then this is a good way to, to support that. You know, just a quick comment, Dr. Schoenfeld made a good point. You know, there are drugs in every school. And, you know, yeah. I, and I know there's been a lot of talk in this community about this topic, but I think you've taken an aggressive approach. And, you know, I, and it's, I think that's very important. You know, and the public is aware that, you know, we, you know, we view this as a very serious, you know, each and every day we're involved in this. So I think the, you know, from the beginning of talk, you know, Dr. McLaughlin mentioned the helpers and, you know, uh, just the fact that that having the canine dog could you know it just could could enhance you know our ability to to, to help okay um naomi and michael um, did your hand up did you okay so naomi then michael um pulling together um something that michael said with a few other pieces <clears throat> 
I, I agree completely that writing policy with a, a sunset clause can, can be difficult because it, it can expire without being addressed properly at that point in time. Um, at the same time, it might very well raise many people's comfort level if there were some way to build in a dry run of some sort before it hits full policy for the indeterminate future. I don't know what that would look like or what, um, what that would require. Michael, you might have some ideas on that. But I wonder if there's any way that there could be an interim step that would allow people to see uh, what happens, what the result is, how it is handled, and, and give a sense of how that would look moving forward. So to your end, if I would, I would call compromise language was that there would be an annual report of the usage of this policy and its results, and that way annually the policy requires us to review data, and that way if we feel that the data requires us to make adjustments to the policy, we have regular reviews to do that. Would that be something that would be of benefit, do you think? I think I could probably get behind that if the review is during the summertime after the school year is done. Um, I think that that's something that I could see. And I think that keeps our conversation going as well. Um, so with that, um, I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, I just wanted to actually, again, thank everybody. I actually would like to thank Dr. McLaughlin for uh, the information up front about uh, what the school district and um, Safeguard is doing beyond just uh, the dog. I think that it's very important for the community to see that beyond uh, that. It uh, was brought to my light with a conversation um, with Dr. McLaughlin just uh, last week. So I just wanted to reiterate that for everybody. Thanks. Andy? So two things real quick. One, um, I, I'm in full agreement that whatever, whether it's a policy that's only there for a, you know, one time or whether we put in a review, I mean, I think it's healthy that we look at it and see the effectiveness because it's a pretty big, big step for us and it needs to be living at least initially and then maybe it gets more steady state. So, because one of the things that came to mind is I was thinking about kids, I mean, having raised three over the years, still raising them to an extent. Um, we've talked solely about lockers here, doing up and down. Somebody that's into this sort of thing, but maybe not utterly smart, could decide to go into a classroom and stash something in the back cabinet or something like that. So one of the things I'd like us to consider is sort of mixing it up a little bit and maybe, you know, what, what are, the, from a legal standpoint, I know we don't know the answer, what is the ability to go into a classroom that might not be occupied, but a classroom to just do a quick scan around or things like that? Because we, we every it's always been about the locker and and Joe putting something in Jim's locker to get Jim in trouble or whatever, but somebody that's really trying to hide it is going to put it in some place that is not standard that you'd think they'd be searched. So one of one of the things I'd like us to do when we get closer to looking at this is sort of the flexibility that we have in terms of other stuff. And then just like to close to thank you guys, especially um, Detective Murray and Prentice for. Uh, for your honesty because I think it's important for us as well as parents to hear you say that because you're in the schools every day and a lot of times I think there's two groups one group that says I believe there's drugs in school and there's another group that say I don't want that that's that's a, a, a wives tale it's a fantasy they aren't really there so to get sort of that honest feedback I think is very important to to have us here as we go through this so just real quick Mm -hmm. Just as a service memo, <clears throat> the um, if, if people listening are concerned about someone throwing something in their locker that's not, you know, being set up or whatever, every kid's entitled to a free lock from the school, um, combination lock. I know we're a click of the mouse society, but I actually, for my own edification, I timed a kid. I said, here's a lock on the locker, unlock it. So I timed them. It was four seconds. So this, the locks are free and available to the kid. Um, four seconds isn't a huge amount of time. You want to protect your valuables. You worry about someone putting something that's not yours. So that's available to anybody and everybody. Thank you. Uh, Michael? Thank you for that clarification. I was under the uh, misunderstanding that actually lockers were not allowed on the lock. So thank you very much. The... You can't uh, you can't bring your own lock. It has to be a, no. That's 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 yeah, understood. And but free. they could have lockers. Yeah. Locks, yes. Okay, um, we've done a lot of talking tonight, but we what we haven't done is I think um, 
iterated to the public what we're being asked to do. Um, in our packets, we do have an agreement, a draft agreement um, that was, you know, is between the Merrimack School District uh, for in the introduction of a dog, a drug sniffing dog into the high school and middle school. And what I think we need to do is make it available to the public. Either we have to read it tonight, which I know that might be long, or we need to get it on our website. With that, knowing it's a draft, I think we also, as a board, uh, want language added. And tell me if I'm not speaking in consensus, that I'd like an annual review at the conclusion of every school year to the use of this resource and its results as part of as part of the um, documentation. So I don't know if there's a way that we can either add the language and then post it. And um, because I don't think we're going to make a vote on this tonight because I don't think we have exactly the wording that we're ready for. Um, but I would like us to get moving on this because we have talked about this the majority of my time on the board, but more intensely in the last couple of years, that we have what I will call a conclusion. So is it um, the consensus of the board that with this adjustment that we're comfortable with having this agreement to bring the dogs into the school. Andy? Two things. One, I think I'd like to I'd like to ask whether we need to have Attorney Peel look at this first, just as a pass through to see if there's any concerns. And then whether we could see this before it gets published, you know, with the added word to it, just so that that we have one more chance to look at it before we decide. Because this because two days ago was the first time I saw this. Mm -hmm. We've had a good discussion. I mean, adding a draft to the top, we can look at it and then maybe take action at the next meeting and then put it up at that point. I mean, I don't want to rush here. I want to make sure we do this right. So, so um, it certainly can be done uh, to bring it to uh, Attorney Peel's attention. But this is, this is really, um, there's nothing in here, uh, Marge and I have, together concluded that uh, is vastly different from the MOU that was attached to this. So this is just another way to kind of clarify that. So if it would make the board feel better, we could do it. Um, Marge and I have not felt the need to do that in this particular case. This is really an agreement. It's not a, it's, you know, does, it's, it's an agreement between the two entities on both sides of McKellen Street. So if the board wishes it, we can do it. But we, we certainly don't, uh, skimp on using her so if you wanted us to do it we would this is just not a time we felt the need to do that based on what you've read do you have pause as to the content that you would like attorney peel to review it because you know we definitely support if that's the consensus of the board as well well i'm just one person i'm because we have her at our at our beck and call so to speak it would be good i in my opinion just to to have an eye go across it okay and Michael? Well, I, I don't. I definitely uh, agree with uh, Board Member Schneider. Um, I also think that since it is actually referencing the uh, memorandum that's attached, I'm not sure if it should be reviewed with that, just because it is five years old. And mm -hmm. This okay. might be an opportunity. Just um, since it's referencing it, it, might make sense to just review it together. So can I? Um, yeah. Get a uh, clarification. Go ahead. Uh, just because I know this would be what Marge would ask if she were here. <laughs> So um, we will add, <clears throat> so we, there's no change in the text that anybody has offered tonight except for adding uh, a reference to an annual review at the conclusion of every school year. So that would be added to this, but there's no other change, number one, right? There's no other change, just that? Correct. Okay. And then the second thing is that this document would be reviewed by Attorney Peel and that um, would it be the board's intent to have the superintendent put this on um, the February 20th agenda and then we would um, at that point talk to you about what any anything that attorney Peel said and then and then so Marge would add this to the agenda next time okay uh, Cinda so if attorney Peel has no feedback would we be comfortable then putting it on a consent agenda um at this point, just because the language is different, it might make sense just to do it as an agenda item. Okay. Just as, you know, to, to literally review the content of the, the agreement. Okay. That but sounds good. I also think, you know, based on all that we've heard tonight and whatever, um, it, it, obviously if it's very little to discuss with Attorney Peel's feedback, we'd make a very quick discussion, a very quick vote. Okay. So that's fine. if that works, then we will look to try to um, 
put this decision to a conclusion on the 20th. So if that makes sense for everyone concerned, that gives you some time to, um, if it goes forward as we expect it would, to implement it in this school year. Perfect. So and, um, just to, I guess what I'll call a PSA, um, to the community that has reached out to us with questions and concerns, um, we will have this put on our website, the draft of this. And uh, with that, um, if there are questions, concerns, or comments, please reach out. Um, you can definitely send me an email, and I will share with our board members um, the feedback that you give. I know this is a very hot and hot topic item for uh, the community. It's probably one of the biggest questions I ever get is, what, you, what is the school board doing about the drugs in our schools? And I'm saying, well, please give me an example of where your concern lies. And with that context, gives us understanding. So, you know, I, I do appreciate that. So if there is feedback from the community, send it to me at shannon.barnes at sau26.org. And we will disseminate it and have it um, as data points for our further discussion next next meeting. I just. Of course, Mark. One last thing. So <clears throat> I just will take this opportunity again um, to remind the public that um, Merrimack Safeguard is a group of citizens mm -hmm. who um, are really intent on tackling this issue. And um, it is not a huge group of people. I know that there is a lot of concern, and rightly so, in the community. Um, and there is a group dedicated to achieving um, good results about this issue, and we can't do it alone. So it's the first Thursday of every month at St. James Church from 6 to 7.30, and I really encourage folks to um, join that group. You don't have to come every, every, every month, but um, that's the place where positive community-oriented action can happen to achieve a good result. And so I just, once again, I encourage people to come to that meeting and to help us. Thanks. Thank you, and thank you all for your time and decade of service with us on this very topic, and I think we're finally getting to where we can do uh, some real good with, with the resources that we have. So I think Gunny's retired. Dallas is in place now. Retiring. Retiring. And, uh, Dallas is in place. Dallas is not narcotics trained yet. Okay. But he will be, but Gunny is still in service for narcotics so. Excellent. Excellent. So thank you for the update on that. Uh, some great service to our community. And on to item number five, which is the proposed school calendar for 2017-2018. It says Marge Chaffrey, but we know that uh, Mark McLaughlin will be taking over this discussion point. So Mark, it's still on you. Okay. So um, <clears throat> the uh, district um, annually um, makes sure that a number of uh, um, interested parties have a chance to weigh in on the issue of the school calendar. And so what I'd like to do tonight is report on two of those interested parties. Uh, one is the uh, Merrimack Teachers Association. Uh, <clears throat> a, uh, annually, a request is made of the MTA to provide information about their preferences relative to the next school year's calendar, and uh, we have those right now. So. As relates to, and so what I'm going to share with you is the results of the MTA's answers to the questions about their calendar preferences. So uh, relative to Columbus Day, no school, um, the teachers reported that they um, prefer to have that off uh, Columbus Day. Thanksgiving break, their preference is uh, a Wednesday through Friday uh, off. That would be the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th of November. Uh, the MTA also um, issued a preference for uh, the winter holiday break, the last day of school being on Thursday, December 21st, with the first day back being uh, Tuesday, January 2nd. Um, they also uh, issued a preference for no school on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, they do not wish to have, uh, they wish to have school, <laughs> say double negative, they wish to have school on President's Day. Uh, their preference for February break is whatever dates do not coincide with Massachusetts vacation. Relative to April break, their preference is the last day of school being Friday, April 20th, and the first day back being Monday, 
April 30th. So those are the results of the uh, MTA's response to the calendar survey. The Merrimack Support Staff Association, uh, Educational Support Staff Association, or MESA, uh, were asked similar questions, and um, <clears throat> their response is as follows. We recommend that all holidays listed in the Master Agreement, Article 13, between the Merrimack School District and the Merrimack Educators Support Staff Association shall occur on the respective days and that school will not be in session on those days. There is agreement between the MTA and the support staff on most of the specific items. Um, <clears throat> the first day of school, their preference is Monday, August 28th, 2017. Uh, <clears throat> no school on Columbus Day, October 9th. Uh, no school on Wednesday through Friday, November 22nd, 23rd, and 24th for Thanksgiving break. Um, they prefer a holiday break, the last day of school being Friday, December 22nd, and the first day back being January 2nd. Uh, they prefer no school on Martin Luther King Day. They wish to eliminate President's Day. They would like the last day of school to be Friday, February 23rd, first day back, Monday, March 5th. And for April break, they prefer Friday, April 27th, 2018, and the first day back being Monday, May 7th. So there's a little difference between themselves and the MTA on that. And the third group um, that uh, is asked to weigh in would be the parents, and I think uh, Board Member Barnes, uh, Chair Barnes is going to speak to that. Yes. Uh, historically, the last four or five years, we have looked for feedback from the community. And last year was the first year we were able to use uh, SurveyMonkey as a vehicle to uh, get uh, compilable and, and readable data to, to really make informed decisions. Um, with that, we want to continue the tradition of communicating and getting the feedback that we're looking for. And uh, we did. We got over 500 responses last year um, where we were getting handfuls years prior based on just anecdotal data from um, individual emails that parents would send. So we really got what you would call measurable, um, me a measurable uh, population. So the questions that we want to ask um, this coming year is, uh, do you support having no school on Columbus Day? Do you support having no school the day before Thanksgiving? Do you support extending the Christmas holiday vacation? Um, and actually, we don't want to do that one uh, because it was about Monday, January 2nd. And this year, it's going to be um, Monday, January 1st, so the holiday will take care of itself. So we actually don't have that concern. So we will eliminate that from this year's survey. Um, so th the next one is, do you support having no school on Martin Luther King Day? Uh, do you support having no school on President's Day, recognizing that the following week is February vacation? And then... Um, then the final one was teacher workshops that are held as a cluster of days at the beginning of the school year would delay the start of school for students by up to four days. Would you support a school calendar that had such an impact on the start of school for students? Now, this one's a very interesting one as well. Um, things that we got feedback on that really we had, um, when we formulated the questions, maybe didn't um, define um, what's considered obligations well enough. Uh, the first is that per the MTA contract, the first day of school will be the day after Labor Day. Uh, so that is something because it's a contractual obligation. It's not flexible and um, not movable at this time. Um, the next one is we always get feedback anecdotally about uh, Memorial Day and uh, Veterans Day, that uh, they would like to have Veterans Day in session so they can get out earlier at the end of the year. Memorial Day and Veterans Day are legally required holidays by the state, and therefore we are not up for um, being able to make adjustments there. Um, so we want to make sure that as we formulate this survey, and um, with your permission, I'll work with administration to get the survey put together and out. Um, the ones that we'll focus <coughs> on are questions uh, one through five. And then also wanted to address question seven from last year, which is feedback. Uh, SurveyMonkey got um, 500 responses, and others a free form box. And extracting that data was very um, messy and cumbersome. 
uh, from what I've heard from on behalf of administration. So question seven, I think, would be best placed as what I would call the email to the board to the uh, chair, and I can absolutely disseminate the feedback that I get. But we want to eliminate that from the Survey Monkey platform. And if there's anything above and beyond the survey where parents want to give feedback, send it to me, and I will disseminate it to the board and administration so that we can at least um, review it and uh, and discuss any any trends that um, of community interest. But that one was, I guess, very a very difficult thing to extract from Survey Monkey and and get in a, a manageable format. So, from what I've heard. So with that, um, Cinda, do you have any questions, comments? Yeah. Um, no. Thanks for putting this together. Um, last year, we had a lot of positive feedback about um, asking for the feedback and being able to really get some, I guess I would call it statistically significant data. Mm -hmm. um, and we went with it. All of the decisions that we made regarding the calendar aligned um, with the various feedback that we received. Um, so I definitely am supportive of going forward with the survey again for this year. Um, the one thing I might suggest, and I don't know if it's just a maybe an asterisk at the bottom, like a please note, and, and more simply state that um, contractual obligations prevent us from starting school prior to Labor Day um, and that Veterans Day Memorial Day, we don't have flexibility because they're state holiday, they're federal holidays and you know, as mandated by blah, 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 we can't, um, we cannot choose to have school during those days. Um, I think simply just some, something simply stated that, you know, clears that up um, would be helpful. Um, and I'm a little fuzzy about question number six. One through five make um, complete sense to me. Um, but question number six, teacher workshops that are held as a cluster of days at the beginning of the school year would delay the start of school for students by up to four days. Could you support a school calendar that had such an impact on the start of school for students? Um, but I, I just wonder if there's maybe a more direct way to ask that question. You know, set up something like, you know, over the past few years, um, in order to avoid disruption throughout the school year, we front loaded our teacher workshop days um, to be able to extend the mm -hmm. summer for students um, as well as recognizing that um, we have contractual obligations, we cannot start until after Labor Day. Um, yeah. And on that one, Andy, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, I think we took that one into account because we knew we were going into negotiations in the fall. So we took that data point because we were doing the August Academy and we would be renewing it for the second contract if it was, if it was amenable to the constituent. I'm confused. The question number six was, No, 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 I know, yeah. I know in, in contractually it talks about all the days being together in an August Academy mm -hmm. and then starting the day after Labor Day. Right. It's in the contract that's effective. July 1st of this year, this well, past year. So we're in, right, in, year we're, in year, we're, we're entering year two right. effective of the contract. So what you're doing is gathering data to help direct us in our next negotiations. Right, so when this was written, question six, this is last year's survey and we used it so that way as you're going into negotiations you would have that data going into it that the constituents were supportive of starting the day after Labor Day. Right. Negotiations three years from that point. Because that question was put out before you negotiated. Not. Not. No. no not the MTA. The MTA. Was it? The contract that, that took effect the year we're sitting in. Mm -hmm. We finished negotiating that well before the deliberative session last year. This was put out after we got done with the contract. So I'm not really sure what we would have gathered that we could have changed. It's, it's data, that, see the key is, this is my view having okay. negotiated it, is that we put a stake in the ground that said, Can, what? I just need clarification here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Have we done the survey already this year or haven't we? No. We're, no. Okay, so I'm really confused because it says. No, those dates are wrong. That's okay. a cut and paste of last yeah, year's. It's okay. cut and paste of last year, so we can look at what we want to change for this year. Yeah. Right. I just was like, I'm so, like sitting here going, wait, I'm she's seeing modified, that the she's results modified. are here from this year. She used right? that as a cheat sheet to get rid of and modify. Okay. Right, so Thank you. this is um, our base. Our baseline to plan anyway. for this year. <laughs> you didn't know all that? No, I'm kidding. Um, anyway, one of the big points that we heard, that we walked away from negotiations was, 
This has been effective for the last several years. August Academy, starting the day after Labor Day. We also knew that last year when we looked at the calendar, we, we went, wow, we're starting later than usual because of that thing. So what we decided to do, I believe, is ask the question last year, does this work for you as a parent? To take that data and use it in our future negotiations, which would have happened three years from then. And I guess by re-asking the question now, it helps us to continue to get that sort of data. Because again, no teacher workshops during the year, all of them up at the front, and again, we don't start until after Labor Day, right. which is later than most, so it's a mix. I mean, I don't know if the superintendent did any checks to see what any proposed calendars are, but last year there were a group that started after Labor Day and a group that started a couple days before. So there was no heir apparent here. So. Right. so with that, I think that the question is, is cloudy, so maybe we just want to tighten it up to say, you know, are you supportive of school starting the day after Labor Day and front, you know, knowing that it will front load all teacher workshops so they're not sprinkled throughout the year? So just reword it so it's a little more tight, I think, might help us. Yeah, and then I think the part about um, just making sure that we're communicating the dates mm -hmm. that we really don't have control over right, right now. Right, and, and we will have to put that somewhere, you know, you know for future consideration, you know, and, you know, see asterisk. And that we'll talk about what we're contractually obligated to for this for this year. I I just wrote something up. This might be a good guide. It might not be. But okay. I just put in order to have less disruption during the school year. Are you in favor of having the teacher workshop prior to the start of the school year, which would begin after Labor Day? Okay. And the one thing we have to say is um, see note below that you know this data will be gathered for consideration of our next negotiation with the MTA. Um, for a contract that would begin 2020 or whatever it is. So we just have to make sure they don't expect that they'll get a response to this data this year. Because it. I, I think you should put an asterisk just period that this information will just take into consideration for any future guidance. Future negotiations, and, yeah. Well, just in, any guidance in the future. I don't think you have to get, because it's a guidance for us. Because right. it doesn't mean that we're going to do it. Yeah, the only consideration I want to make, because a lot of parents know that we take this data and formulate our final vote on the calendar with it. Yes. So that's not going to be one that we'll formulate our final vote on the calendar with. It's the one that doesn't. No. So that that will just I, I think we'll, just a general yep, but we'll, statement versus a word this one here. Just gotcha. a general statement for everything. Okay. Do you think we have what we need? I do. Good. Okay. Um, and the one thing I want to do as well is go over the proposed calendar, which we usually do as well. So that way, um, as we put it out there, um, and it will go up on the website as well, Matt. Excellent. Um, the goal is to start, as I said, contractually the day after Labor Day, which is September 5th. Um, and, uh, so you'll have um, every day from the 5th on in session. In October, um, right now, we are proposing that Columbus Day be closed, which is October 9th. Um, we are proposing the three-day Thanksgiving holiday uh, for the 22nd, 23rd, and 24th of November. And also the um, legally required Veterans Day holiday is November 10th. So the 10th, 22nd, 23rd, and 24th are the days off in November. In December, the holiday week would um, start the week after um, the week of the 18th. So the 22nd will be the last day of classes. And then classes will resume again on Tuesday, January 2nd, because Monday would be the actual holiday. Um, we are also proposing to have Martin Luther King Jr. Day off, which is January 15th. In February, we'd be looking at the last week for vacation in our initial proposal, which is um, actually going into the first two days of March. So it's the 26th, 27th, 28th of February, and the 1st and 2nd of March would be winter break. Uh, the rest of March would be in session. In April, it would be the last full week of April. So it would be the 23rd, 24th, 25th, 26th and 27th for April vacation, returning to school on the 30th. In May, we would have Memorial Day off per legal requirement, and that would be May 28th. And then in June, um, barring any um, snowstorms, because they never happen in New England, um, the last day of school is scheduled for the 14th, with six built-in makeup days being the 15th and the week of the 18th, uh, hoping that we don't need to use any of them, but being a little realistic. So um, 
if there's no questions from the board on those dates, uh, Cinda? I don't know, maybe it's just a matter of protocol, but are we comfortable putting out a proposed school calendar until before we get the parent feedback, or would it make sense to call it a draft calendar for the time being? We want to call it definitely dra draft or proposed. Yeah, because yeah. yeah, I, I, I feel yeah, like draft proposed print. is too, it's too early to say that it's the proposed calendar, okay. in my opinion, until we get parental. Okay, feedback. draft is good. We can change. And if we can put something with that, um, like a link to the survey or something where they can, or at least, you know, go to survey. And I believe it's going to go through the uh, school portal uh, system as well. So, and then SurveyMonkey can compile it. Yes, Mark? Um, so, <clears throat> in order to come up with the final wording, is it my understanding that you and the superintendent and I will meet? Sure. Okay. Absolutely. So, we'll do that. Okay. And then, I'm just trying to clarify. No, I'm with we'll, you. We'll do that. And then, once we have agreement about that, then this would be published, same draft, with a link to the survey. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, and we will look to do that toot sweet, so that way we'll get it done this week and get it out this week, so we can start to get data in time for our next meeting. Does that make sense all? Andy? Just a quick question to those of you that are on the communications committee. Has any of the discussions on communication come up so far with a alternate way to be able to do what we're trying to do? Just curious. Uh, I think at this point we're trying to uh, bring together all the areas of communication as a starting point and then from there we will forward on taking steps to figure out how we are so we're a little ahead of the game to be able to use this as a guinea pig so to speak of it, I think it's, I think it's just good to take and get the statistics on how we get okay. information I'm not sure if we can actually I, I think through survey monkey you could probably use a, a tag to actually figure out which method they're coming from mm -hmm. Um, I believe I could be wrong and if you can then that actually would help with data to just continue to collect because then you could know if they came from the website if they came from power school or something else so um, actually we um, don't we're not using survey monkey anymore but it's very much that tool but it's associated with um, power school oh, wow. and so that's the tool that we use now to to um, to Andy's question um, I think the communication, in a way, this is an outgrowth of the communications committee, in a way, in that, um, you know, not that we haven't been doing this for the last couple of years anyway, but, you know, it kind of exists on two levels. And I, I think, um, I, I, I wonder if um, the board members uh, Thompson and Gwalliami would agree with me. Um, it exists on two levels. One, it's trying to come to terms with, you know, what are the communication tools that we have and trying to be somewhat more consistent about that. But on the other level, it's just a variety of agreements about doing a better job at communicating. And so that we can do something about right now and have already done. We've taken steps just with our leadership team to talk to them about things they have control over, you know, tomorrow. And so so those those things have already begun to happen. And the fact that we're um, issuing a survey, though it doesn't come immediately out of the, the um, communications committee it's informed by the idea that we need to do a better job of doing that kind of thing so in a way it's existing on those two levels I just like to add to that that I think that through the through the committee there's been great discussions about stuff that they actually can take steps to better uh, communicate out and put more information out today uh, on such, such things that they're actually policies or anything like that I think right now so they're they're small steps but obviously it's it's will obviously come out further once the get a little bit further but there's I think there's a very uh, large amount of information that needs to be disseminated and I think that there's way too many tools out there that we have to figure out which ways we can as a as a district not only communicate to the uh, greater community but also allow our teachers, staff, administration to have the ability based off of which ways we go go forward with. So, Cinda? And to add that, to, to add to that, I think that there's been the realization too that there is low-hanging fruit um, and, and things can be impacted immediately as Dr. McLaughlin said. Um, I Even as a parent, I've noticed differences in some of the information that's coming through um, seems to be improving or um, I'm receiving more frequent 
communication. So, I mean, I've noticed some, some things so far. Excellent. Matt? Just a point of clarification for me. So my task is to make sure the calendar is posted on the website with the word draft on top. That, that's it? Okay. Watermark. Red letters, watermark. Yeah. watermark. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Excellent. Um, so with that, we will plan to compile the data to make the informed vote for the next year's calendar, which is probably, um, if the three of us have known, that's the number one parental feedback we get. You won't grocery shop the same for the next two weeks because anyone that runs into you will tell you how they feel about that. Um, but it's it's really what you call the passionate one because that's their that's their quality family time built into the year. So it's it's definitely a a big ticket item for them. Um, so we're going on to item number um, six, which is the board response to draft warrant articles for the 2017 warrant. Um, so we're going to go through the warrant. Um, I think basically all we're doing right now is um, reviewing the worded up content because we've already gone through the actual uh, ideological content and this has already been reviewed matt correct me if i'm wrong uh, so it meets dra standards yeah it's been uh, review reviewed by both dra and kathy peel great thank you yeah. very much um, so article one is actually to select two school board members and so we will have two uh, slots one for a one-year position which will conclude uh, Davis Powell's uh, original term that Naomi has uh, stepped up to do such a great job filling in and uh, the second would be um, for a three-year term and that would be for um, the role Sind is in right now uh, article two is shall the Merrimack School Board be authorized to accept on behalf of the district without further action by the voters gifts legacies and devices of personal or real property which may become available to the district during the fiscal year a majority vote is required and um, I know Cindy just stepped out so um, what I'll do is I'll go through them and then we'll take a vote at the end so that way we can get all all accounted for um, article 3 is a special warrant article so shall the district raise and appropriate the sum of $196,174 for the purpose of pavement reconstruction at Merrimack High School to include the bus loop around the school building and the front entrance. Article 4, also a special warrant article, shall the district raise and appropriate the sum of $310,000 for the purpose of removal and replacement of asbestos floor tiles on the first and second floor of Merrimack High School and the removal and replacement of cabinets and countertops located in the family consumer science classrooms at Merrimack High School because remember under those cabinets is um, is best as tiling as well um, on to item article number five which is shall the district raise an appropriate an amount up to seventy five thousand dollars said sum not to exceed ten percent of the unencumbered surplus funds remaining at the end of the fiscal year 2016-2017 and to transfer that amount to the school district repair capital reserve fund for the purpose of providing unanticipated and or emergency repairs to all school district facilities now this is one we've been rebuilding since we had to uh, fairly deplete it with um, an emergency expenditure a couple of years ago um, Matt gave me updated and um, accurate numbers. So $153,000 sits in the account now. If approved by the voters, the additional $75,000, which would be the cap, could bring us up to a potential total of $228,000 in that fund at this point. So um, that's where we're at. Article 6. It shall the district raise and appropriate as an operating budget, not including appropriations by special warrant articles and other appropriations voted separately, the amount set forth on the budget posted with the warrant or as amended by vote of the first session for the purposes set forth therein totaling seventy three million six hundred seventy three thousand and fifty seven dollars. Should the art should this article be defeated, the operating budget shall be seventy three million seven hundred thirty eight thousand eight hundred thirty eight dollars, which is the same as last year with certain adjustments required by previous action of the district or by law, or the governing body may hold one special meeting in accordance with RSA forty dash thirteen uh sections oh gosh, you had to use Roman numerals ten and sixteen. <laughs> to take up the issue of a revised operating budget only a majority vote required uh, Cindy we just did a quick run through those articles um, now what we're going to do as a board is go through the votes 
Um, so Article 1 is self-sustaining. We do not have to take a vote on that. Article 2 is uh, regarding gifts and legacies. Um, board, how do you vote? Um, so basically, it's yes or no. So does there have to be a motion a second? There doesn't. There does, doesn't there? You, you have to move these more. These so you do have to move them. Okay, so do I have a motion to accept Article 2? Made by Andy. Do I have a second? Seconded by Cinda. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, none. The motion carries 5 zero, zero. Article 3. Do I have a motion to accept Article 3? Made by Michael. Second. Seconded by Naomi. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, none. The motion carries 5 zero, zero. Article 4. Um, do I have a motion to accept Article 4? Made by Cinda. Seconded by Michael. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. The motion carries 5 zero, zero. Sorry about that. Flipping the page. Article 5. Do I have a motion to accept Article 5? Made by Naomi. Do I have a second? Seconded by Cinda. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. The motion carries 5-0-0. Zero, zero. And finally, Article 6. Do I have a motion to accept Article 6? Made by Andy. Second. Seconded by Michael. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. And the motion carries 5-0-0. Zero, zero. Matt, do you have what you need from us? Yes, thank Excellent. you. Uh, weather permitting, we'll be having a budget committee hearing uh, tomorrow night, and uh, they'll be taking these up at that meeting. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. So Naomi's prepared to, to support the board's position on each of those articles. Thank you. My, uh, Michael, did you have a question? I'm just wearing my glasses. I can't see that well. Uh, I just had a comment. Um, I know that on Article 5, you went over what was currently in um, the reserve. Um, mm -hmm. When you put up the budget book, do you reference what's actually in the reserve in the budget book? that's sent out to the public? The voter's guide? The voter's guide? Yes. Okay. That will be in there. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. Andy? I'd like to ask that as part of the, both the board and the communication committee that the, we, we um, have a chance to review the voter's guide and be able to contribute to making clarifying. Because one, one of the things that we talked about is trying to become maybe overly transparent and knowledgeable about all the budget aspects, like what you did, Matt, for the, um, the capital items here. Um, I'd like to be able to make sure that we have, we're very clear on the voter's guide, okay. anything that we do online or whatever. So if we could get, start reviewing that in a timely fashion, um, once we have that, that would be real helpful. Okay, very good. Excellent. Thank you. That's good stuff. So we are actually on item number seven. We're into the housekeeping stuff. Uh, the approval of January 10th and January 17th minutes. Do I have a motion to accept the January 10th minutes? Made by somebody, Michael, and seconded by Andy. Are there any adjustments or edits to the January 10th minutes? Seeing none, we'll put the motion to a vote. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, none. The motion carries 5-0-0. Zero, zero. We are on to the 17th and actually um i thought about this after our meeting started tonight michael you were here for part of it so i'm going to have you abstain if that's if you're comfortable with that have yourself like i'm going to ask if you felt comfortable I'm, I'm 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 just suggesting just suggesting so uh with that because you did you were probably in two-thirds of it i mean probably closer to three quarters but um just wanted to be sure so do i have a motion to accept the tuesday january 17th minutes made by naomi second Seconded by Cinda. Are there any adjustments to the 17th minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Wait, aye. You're an aye? Okay, you're an aye. I thought so. Opposed? None. Abstain? Uh, Michael Thompson. So the motion carries 4 0 1. And we're on to more fun stuff, which is acceptance of gifts and grants under $5,000 with Matt. Thank you. Uh, the first one we have is uh, to Thornton's Ferry Elementary School uh, from Fidelity Education Matching Gifts. Uh, the Trudeaus, Mr. and Mrs. Charles Trudeau, gave $1,000 uh, to Thornton's Ferry. And Fidelity, the corporation that uh, Mr. Trudeau works for, uh, matched that. Uh, so the sum of $2,000 is going to Thornton's Ferry School at to be used at the discretion of school administration. We thank the Trudeaus and Fidelity very much for that. The next one we have is to Merrimack High School from Shaw's, right here in Merrimack, New Hampshire. The amount of $500 for expenses related to the hockey program. We thank them for that. 
Then lastly, we have from the Health Trust the amount of $2,000. Uh, this gift was received by the Health Care Cost Containment Committee and will be used for work site health and safety activities to benefit employees. So the good work of the Health Care Cost Containment Committee, which is a district committee, uh, has um, given us the opportunity to uh, get $2,000 to better, better the cause. So we have that before you tonight. Thank you. Do I have a motion for the acceptance of Cinda? I move that we accept the gifts with our gratitude. Thank you. Is there a second? Seconded by Michael. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed, none. The motion carries 500. And now we're on to other um, correspondence. Is there any correspondence to come before the board? Cinda? Um, I had a resident reach out to me that was interested in getting involved and um, was, uh, had expressed interest in particular as being a community liaison um, to the communications committee. She was going to reach out to Shannon expressing her interest. Um, yes, I did get an email from her and plan to get back to her tomorrow. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Any other communications? Michael? I had a resident uh, reach out to me in regards to the canine in the schools and uh, was saying that they were in favor of it. Thank you. And I received correspondence from a resident regarding uh, varsity baseball field conditions and had concerns on that. Um, that constituent actually has already met with administration and facilities and there is a plan of action to uh, make the necessary improvements uh, using internal resources. So it was good feedback and a very productive meeting. So it's all set. Um, is there any comments from the board? Seeing none, we will go on to item number 10, new business. Is there any new business to come before the board? I have one. You're probably noticing at your places that there are legislative updates uh, from the New Hampshire School Boards Association. They're here uh, because this is what's on the docket um, in the short term. So what's coming up and what's being reviewed in the House right now. Um, the goal is, and in the Senate as well, the goal is to have our uh, Merrimack delegation invited to a, an upcoming school board meeting before the exchange of bills between the House and the Senate, which is, happens in mid-March. So these are to be used as a guide to see all that's coming up in uh, legislation in Concord that is impacting education and to go through and find, say, two. I think two is probably a manageable number, knowing who's going to be coming. Um, and how much time we would have to give. Uh, but two items um, that are coming up in Concord that you may want um, feedback from our delegation about what's going on with those bills. So uh, we reached out uh, our uh, rep Christensen. Chris Christensen will be leading the, uh, the organization, the delegation coming before the board. We're hoping either the 20th or um, the first meeting in March. Uh, we're definitely shooting for the 20th, but if not, it will be the first meeting in March that we will have them at our table. So if you can send Marge copy me on uh, the two areas where you want to make sure that they're prepared to discuss with us um, the bills that you want uh, further information on, then we will uh, have them kind of tipped off so that they're ready to uh, have the information at the ready for us just as we do with other people that come before us. So seeing, yes, Michael? Should we um, reference those on the website and put them out there for any feedback from the greater community, too? Um, I'm sure we can do that. Uh, Matt? So what we can do is put uh, coming soon, you know, Merrimack delegation to visit school board. Here are some bills. And if you can put these summaries on the um, – and just tell them when they'll be coming. And yep. maybe we'll have an audience at one of our meetings or something. <laughs> Well, well we've just put a $73 million budget to an empty room, but you never know. <laughs> you never know. So, um, and as I said, we're shooting for the 20th, but uh, on the outside, we'll do the first in March. Um, the next is committee reports. Are there committee reports? I think there are a bunch. So we will start with um, Michael. Or Naomi, did you have your hand up? I'll just, I'll just go to the end and work my way out. So I think we all have something to give. Um, over the past couple of weeks, I have attended meetings of the Budget Committee. Um, we've met a number of times. I was also part of the um, liaison smaller committees to the upper elementary, to maintenance, and to special services. Uh, we are, have 
two more meetings scheduled, I believe, uh, to look at warrant articles and to reach a conclusion. Excellent. And do you want to give a quick overview of our, our delegate to uh, the New Hampshire School Board Association? This is our first meeting since then. Yes, and I was one of three people from the board who were present. Uh, you were there as well, as well as uh, Cinda. Um, it was a wonderful experience. It was a great way to spend a day. The how many school boards were represented there? They, na they named it at one point. So do we go 48. 48. A, a lot of school districts. Uh, there was a sharing of general concerns, uh, voting on various items of interest to districts across the state, and consensus brought on a number of issues, as well as a sharing of a workshop on what was the official title of the workshop on that one? There were two. Um, there was one on right to know laws. Right. One on right to know. Absolutely. Thank you. And I will say that it gives you perspective going to those because there are some very rural, um, I think one was about guns in schools, and they talk about how kids leave straight from school and go hunting with their families. So what, so what happens, you know, when, you, when dad picks up his son and has a, a you know, his, he's ready to go to the woods. So those kind of things. So it's, it's definitely a diverse audience. So very interesting. It did a... Um Good job of opening my eyes, at least, to the diversity of needs of different areas of local control, I suppose, yeah. Excellent. And so, Michael, I think you're next. Uh, yes. Um, since I didn't get to comment on the last one because I left early. Um, so I had the professional development meeting. I just want to say that uh, I continue to be impressed by the staff and how much time that they spend. Um, furthering their education and uh, the betterment of the school district. Uh, I think that it's it's something that is not known within the community. So just uh, obviously see a lot of that during the meeting, and I just wanted to pass that on to the greater community. Um, also had the Parks and Rec meeting last month. Um, numerous things. I, I still think that what they do for the community is quite amazing, how much with so little staff. Uh, they have brought in a part-time uh, assistant to help with the events within the town um, and also we have discussed possibly revisiting the need for additional fields within the town so thank you is the winter carnival the 25th this month please check the website okay. <laughs> that's usually because a big draw with a lot of our right students now. so i figure their parents are watching i'm traveling so much that i'm <laughs> <laughs> excellent cinda as Naomi mentioned, I also attended as the alternate delegate the New Hampshire School Board Association, and it really was interesting. Um, it was the first one that I had ever been to, so it's really helped me see kind of the big picture of how um, that organization works and, and how it all pools together from the various districts throughout the state. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. Um, and then secondly, we talked to, also talked about this earlier, safeguard meeting was on... Um, February 2nd and we talked about a variety of things uh, one thing um, you know we talked about the canine update um, the mental health committee gave an update um, this AOK -okay asking for help uh, we have a student at the district um, who is is working on a project um, and is getting some support on this ask for help AOK -okay, um, campaign the um, the next meeting for Safeguard is Thursday, March 9th. Um, normally, it's the first meeting of every month, um, but because of the school break, the winter break, um, it will be on the 9th from 6 to 7.30 at St. James Church. Um, I will also um, state any members of the community that are interested in being part of the community efforts. Um, we welcome participation at this group. It's open to the community and would love to see um, is as many community members as possible that want to get involved. Andy? So actually, I don't have any committee reports. The um, uh, Ceresk, um hasn't met since our last time. Um, the uh, um, Planning and Building Committee has still not met. Um, however, on the uh, 19th of January was the, um, the community forum that we discussed earlier that was uh, sponsored by Merrimack Safeguard. Uh, I found it extremely interesting. It was a panel of, uh, I think it was five individuals from the different uh, cross sections of faith and youth, business, uh, police, school. Um, I think that was it. And uh, a lot of good sharing of information. There were probably about 
10 or so, 10 to 15 resource tables around the room from, uh, as, as Mark and the Chief said, uh, different aspects. <clears throat> but more importantly, there were close to 50 people that attended uh, that were residents, you know, both from kids as well as parents and adults that came. And there was a lot of good conversation about uh, ways that we can really help get involved in town, get involved with kids, get involved in processes, a lot of good sharing of from a business angle, from the uh, police angle, from the school angle of what's going on and, and, and uh, how we can contribute more. So it was a good segue and a good lead in, if you will, to all the different tools we have in all the different aspects of the community. Um, and the utilization of the canine in the school was just one of the dimensions of that. So that was a real clear tie in that it's not just the school and the police, it's a full community effort to really help address some of the issues we see. So. And I attended on the first of the month the Healthcare Cost Containment Committee. And on the 19th was also the health fair, which was for uh, staff and also um, town employees that would be under the health trust umbrella so they could come in and get uh, biometric screenings with nurses through Health Trust. And there were a number of uh, community resources that came in, had booths, and each one um, provided raffle items as well. So a real draw to get, um, there's such a push in this district for staff to embrace wellness, so preventative versus reactionary medicine. Um, programs that they have that we're you know, trying to get embraced are things like um, getting Fitbits, you know, making sure that you're moving and, and uh, the wellness committee is very involved with, with that as well. Uh, the health trust program has a Fitbit reimbursement plan. So if you get, um, it doesn't have to be Fitbit, I'm, I'm using a brand specific like Kleenex, but a wellness bracelet, there's a, probably 50 of them you could choose from, different models and different brands. But if you buy it, um, register it through your, um, your profile on their portal, uh, you can get a hundred dollars uh, rebate. So there are a lot of ways of getting uh, wellness rebates through Health Trust as well that save staff money and, and get them to really work toward wellness. And it's at no cost to the district because it's through the Health Trust program. So it's been very beneficial. And um, some of the local um, organizations that did support this event um, were given certificates of appreciation from us. But um, I'll list them off so the community knows who is. Uh, supporting our district as well, and uh, we can give them support in return. Big Kahuna's Cafe and Grill, Broadway Bound, Convenient MD, CVS, Digital Credit Union, Elliott Orthodontics, Fit Lab, which used to be the Gold's Gym, Fleet Feet, Merrimack Parks and Rec, Merrimack Vision Care, New Balance, uh, Nutrition in Motion, Service Credit Union, Shaw's, Weight Watchers, Whole Foods Market, who provided a raffle item because they couldn't attend, uh, YMCA of Greater Nashua, Yoli Better Body System, Just Naturals and Company, who also sent a raffle item because they were unable to attend, and the Merrimack Adult Education Program. So they, our staff had a lot of resources at their fingertips to uh, start the year off on a positive foot and, and have a healthy year ahead of them. So we thank them for supporting our event. It's the first annual event, so we expect that uh, based on the feedback we got that it will be a, a growing event um, in the coming years. So over 220 attended, and uh, we expect that number will increase as, as the years go on. So very excited about that, and uh, they'll meet again next month. Uh, are there any other committee reports? We're good. Um, so we will go on to public comments on agenda items, and we do have an empty room, so I'm going to skim right over that. I will take a, we'll take a moment to sign the manifest, and I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Made by Andy. Do I have a second? Seconded by Michael. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. And we are adjourned. Thank you and good night.